of you. I, on behalf of the SAO Governing Council and Office Bearers, welcome you all in this webinar on step-by-step -step diagnosis and management of glaucoma. Before we start the webinar, I will seek uh, permission from the president of uh, SAO, SARC Academy of Ophthalmology, Professor O.K. Malla, sir, to uh, allow us to start the webinar. Malla, sir. Sir, you are mute, sir. Sir, you are mute. I want to have five minutes. Is it all right, Rajesh? Yeah. 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 I won't take more than five minutes or maybe less than that. You know, what I want to say is uh, I like to begin uh, this uh, webinar by welcoming you all. You know, it has been a pleasure to see all of you, though virtually. Again, another thing, I hope you all are doing well and managing managing to keep away from the COVID, you know, which has disturbed our lifestyle and our program also of the SARP Academy of Ophthalmology. Uh, and I want to congratulate and thank uh, the organizers, uh, mainly Raj, Ajad and uh, Rajesh, Namrata and their team for organizing this webinar for the first time in SARC Academy of Ophthalmology. And special thanks to Professor Nadim, you know, for organizing this special session this evening, you know, on of glaucoma, you know, and uh, he has done uh, plenty of work in glaucoma and he has collected all the wonderful speakers from all these countries of the SARC, you know, and thank you Nadim for doing that, you know, you have included all the countries of the, of the region and I must say the important topics uh, I had asked uh, Rajesh and also Raj joined me that we must pick up the important topics and concentrate on what the updates and uh, highlight some of the new things uh, on the subject, you know, like today glaucoma. That's what we're going to hear from the experts uh, this evening. Like I said, you know, Vision 2020 took care of, uh, did a tremendous job, took care of the important causes of blindness, uh, and we have been successfully eliminating them, namely cataract and trachoma, geropthalmia, low visions, and all those uh, conditions are virtually now eliminated. And our problems now is going to be glaucoma, which we are doing to deal with in greater detail, step by step towards diagnosis and management. And then we'll, there will be some of the important retinal diseases, you know, which will be dealing with maybe subsequently in our uh, these uh, webinars. Um, uh, glaucoma is such an important uh, subject. You know, the other day I was listening to glaucoma and somebody very uh, casually defined glaucoma as a disease of the optic nerve, full stop, you know. And the f most important, number one cause of irreversible blindness is glaucoma. And by the time the patient come to you of glaucoma, about 50% have already visual damage, you know. So it is such an important disease, you know, and I'm sure we are going to deal with this uh, with this disease uh, this evening in greater detail. And uh, they are going to throw uh, some uh, new uh, developments in the uh, diagnosis and uh, management of the disease. I don't think I'll go further. Without going further, I would like to give the floor to our moderator to continue to start the, the, the session. Thank you, Rajesh, over to you. Thank you, Amit, Rajesh. Uh, Thanks a lot for your blessings and permission to start the <laughs> webinar. This concept of webinar under the uh, SAO, uh, under the ages of SAO was, you know, conceptualized and thought of uh, by Professor Rajvadan Azad, sir. And he's the person behind, uh, you know, all of us, you know, collecting together and doing this uh, academic exercise. So I'll request uh, Azad, sir, to speak a few words on how he thought of it and, you know, uh, what all we should do uh, in future webinars in order to make it uh, successful. Azad, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. And it's nice to meet all of you. And um, as uh, Nadim said, that uh, the, the, the uh, COVID-19 has given us opportunity to meet uh, virtually and uh, otherwise a physical uh, you know, 
meeting, you know, for certain reasons and for many other reasons, it's not possible for all of us to be on one floor. So this gives a very, uh, you know, uh, very, very, very good uh, platform for all of us to meet. Glaucoma, you know, as a student and until now, glaucoma has been an enigma. And the definition of glaucoma, as I remember when I was a resident, that time that is a, you know, is a condition where there is a pressure. There is a variation in the pressure. Earlier, we used to think that glaucoma is because of high pressure. And I, I, I'm, you know, being very naive because in the midst of a, a glaucoma specialist, I'm making this statement. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, more or less, it may be true. The glaucoma may be in high intraocular pressure and glaucoma may be in the low intraocular pressure. Glaucoma may be in the normal intraocular pressure. So the glaucoma has been an enigma. And uh, But for the uh, recent researches and recent innovations like glaucoma valve and many other things which have come in the field of ophthalmology that has revolutionized the treatment of glaucoma. As far as we are concerned, we are only... Uh, you know, concerned with, uh, you know, like, you know, when we are doing retinal detachment surgery and putting the, you know, the belt buckle, the buckle, the pressure goes high, or maybe when we are injecting the silicone oil, then the pressure goes high. In all these situations, we need a glaucoma specialist. And, uh, you know, more or less, we, we, we all also have devised our own, uh, you know, uh, treatment protocol for these conditions, which are related to, uh, you know, the retina as, Professor Malla said. Uh, the concept, as he, Rajesh said, I thought that in the plethora of the, these, you know, these, uh, these, these webinars, I thought it is better we, you know, do few, uh, few uh, webinars, but that should be full of rich, rich with the information, uh, rich with the knowledge. And what would be the better way, you know, to start with a glaucoma? And that too from uh, Nadim, you know, Nadim has been a uh, uh, pioneer in this field in our region and not only region but internationally he is well known for that so i thought let us start with uh, professor nadim il organizer on glaucoma then we have on retina, uh, retina we have on other subjects and we will have be having every 3 months uh, a webinar like this we will have a fewer webinars but rich webinars and webinars which will give a uh, uh, you know, uh, useful information to all our participants, all our audience. Uh, and as the title of this webinar is Step-by-Step -step Glaucoma. I think this is very apt. Uh, I don't know. I think must be this will not be from, uh, from, from uh, Nadim, Professor Nadim only. So uh, I think this is a, uh, you know, a very well conceptualized and I, I congratulate uh, Professor Nadim for having you know, the galaxy of speakers that we have today. And uh, without uh, going any further, I'll request uh, Rajesh to you know, carry on this session. And uh, I'll be a silent uh, audience uh, until the end. Thank you very much for uh, all of us, uh, uh, for all of you, to all of you, for having, you know, met virtually and then, you know, uh, uh, to uh, we, we 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 have been able to assemble this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank thank you, sir, for your kind words. And uh, we will begin the uh, webinar, and we will keep having the opinions of our opinion leaders and the panelists. Uh, uh, Nadim, sir, you have to say something, or we shall start the uh, speakers. You are. I like to. I like Nadim to. Give a, you know, a, a, a what you call as a capsule of the whole, uh, you know, this uh, webinar because yeah. he has, uh, you know, prepared it. I want that he should give uh, what all the speakers yeah. are saying. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just a small, small, yeah. just, Rajesh, for Let, the legit. Yeah. Thank you, Raj, uh, Raj for uh, the compliments uh, that you've made about me. Uh, we're all uh, together and we are all. Uh, brothers and sisters in this half region, you all know that this region is a little different from the rest of the world. We have all these statistics. We have uh, all the information mostly coming from the West. And they have their different format of diseases. Their glaucoma is very different from our glaucoma. So 
and that's the reason that i have put up this topic of step by step diagnosis in glaucoma because you know the if anything is diagnosed properly only then it can be treated properly so the purpose of holding this seminar the basic things for the diagnosis was to in, involve our residents involve our young ophthalmologists and also our uh, accomplished ophthalmologists who are uh, not glaucoma specialists who have the understanding of the diagnosis uh, before they move on to the, towards the treatment of these uh, patients and sark region uh, in asia holds majority of the population of the asia you know the india pakistan bangladesh and sudan uh, nepal and maldives sri lanka and uh, afghanistan all these countries uh, you know they compose major chunk of the asia's population and we have so many of the patients suffering from glaucoma that we ought to have uh, ourselves very good understanding of the diagnosis and our juniors should also have very good understanding of the diagnosis and management of glaucoma so this was the main purpose of holding this topic so that all of us come on to one page and after discussion we bring on to consensus few things few recommendations out of this webinar so that our colleagues get benefit from this so thank you very much uh, i think we are getting late now we should start the presentations thank you rajesh for accepting my request to be the moderator you are the best person to hold this uh, uh, webinar as a moderator thank you all of you for being with us and sparing your valuable time for this webinar thank you sir for the kind words and uh, we begin the webinar with the first speaker and that is professor suman thapa who is the head of glaucoma nepal glaucoma eye clinic til ganga institute of ophthalmology kathmandu nepal and uh, professor thapa will be uh, discussing with us about uh, glaucoma screening so uh, i'll request professor thapa to share his uh, slides good evening everyone okay so are you able to see my slides no uh, we cannot see your slides uh, just go to share screen in the center have you opened the powerpoint uh yes i have opened the powerpoint now you just go to the share screen in the uh, the zoom uh, uh, screen share screen yes click that i have got options of desktop microsoft powerpoint and open the presentation sir your pr presentation yes. will be there no ppt your ppt aha uh -huh. you will see an option with dot ppt just open and don't put it in slide show otherwise it will not come just okay. open it All right. Just. Sorry about this. Okay, I'll now uh, share screen. Then it will be seen the PPT. Share. You can see the slide. Like that. Perfect. Now put it in share. Uh, share. Put it on the share screen. I mean, put it on the slide show. Uh, but this, these are not my slides. These are not my slides. This is Dr. Uh, Abzal slide, I think. This Sir, one. Sir, we'll have to stop. Yeah. Share now. You share yours. Okay. Share screen. I'm sorry about this. Then click the share. PPT. Hello. Click the PPT and then again click share on the right bottom. Share screen, then click the PPT and then there's a blue button on the right bottom. Share. You have to click that also. In the same screen. Okay. So, so I'm at, I'm pressing the share screen, and then desktop. You share. No, you have opened your PowerPoint. No. I haven't opened it. No, no. You have to open your PowerPoint. You first open your PowerPoint. I did that, but again, I 
no. Open it. Open the PowerPoint. Then come to this screen. Then click share screen. And then you will go to the, your desktop where your PowerPoint is opened. You have to click that. And then share. And then it will come. Okay. Now I am sharing. You are seeing your PowerPoint? I can okay. click that. So actually your, your Zoom is minimized. You can see a black box uh, in the on your screen actually your zoom is minimized i think okay now everything is ah yes you can see the share screening option in the center yeah i press that okay click on that share okay what uh, what option are you getting there i'm getting open system preferences then any other option sir is it a Mac? Yeah, it's a Mac. There shouldn't okay. be no problem at all. Hmm. Okay. Uh, can I? Can you excuse me for? Uh, can the second speaker come so that I can uh, take you some help? You you email your presentation to yeah. Yeah. the yeah. admin. Admin, uh, please coordinate. Carlo. Uh, you can play. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So I just can you go to the next speaker? Can you have the next speaker? But it doesn't look nice enough because it won't be in order. <laughs> Yeah, but the next speaker who has not been able to join, uh, I've been uh, talking to her. We are, we are talking about step by step, and it's not going to be step by step, you know. Let him try. Dr. Mayuri Khamar, and I'll request her to share her screen. She is the treasurer of the Glaucoma Society of India, and she'll be uh -huh. talking about gonioscopy and imaging of anterior segment for glaucoma diagnostics and management. Just hold on. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. At the outset, I would, I would like to thank uh, organizers SAR committee for giving me this opportunity to share my some pearls on the gonioscopy and imaging in the anterior segment for the can you hear me? Rajesh, am I heard? Perfect, perfect. Yes. Carry on. Okay. okay. So uh, gonioscopy is a fundamental part of the comprehensive examination and it's done not only initially for all cases of glaucoma patients glaucoma suspects as well as the shallow entry chamber, but it should be repeated periodically. Not only it gives the grading of the entry chamber angle, but it is useful for the differential diagnosis of the secondary glaucoma. In childhood glaucoma, it helps us in, not, uh, in the diagnosis as well as provides the prognosis. It is also done for the assessment of the change in the ankle morphology after doing laser PI. And also one should know perfectly to do gonioscopy if you want to do laser trabeculoplasty. There are basically two methods of doing it, indirect gonioscopy and direct gonioscopy. Indirect gonioscopy again has a two dimensions. It is a dynamic gonioscopy by doing indentation gonioscopy or manipulative gonioscopy. I will talk about that later on. Now, what are the informational goals when you do gonioscopy for primary glaucomas? Is this angle open or closed in its natural position? If the angle closure exists, is it oppositional or it is a synical permanent closure? And if this angle is open, is this angle is ang occludable in the future? So these are our informational goals. And how do we interpret? Looking at the angle structures visible, it decides whether it is a narrowness or the openness of the angle. The iris configuration and pattern gives an occlutability of the angle, as well as we can diagnose some of the syndromes. Abnormal features like pigments, blood vessels, everything exuded, this all will help in giving the secondary part of the glaucoma. Now, before starting the interpretation of the gonioscopic pictures, let me take you back to the basics. 
we know that the gonioscope has a mirror in it and the mirror means whatever you see is exactly in the opposite part as shown in this figure if the blood vessel is situated at 11 o'clock in mirror you will see at 7 o'clock and when you rotate clockwise the relationship of the two structures will remain as it is now precisely let us diagnose angle structure from anterior to posterior the first glistening band that you see here is the shawl base line next to it is the anterior part of the non pigmented meshwork and the posterior half is pigmented trabecular meshwork and then is the white line that you see here a running white band is the sclerous part and the gray zone that you see posterior to it is the ciliary body band or the angle recess so one has to identify the structure while doing the gonioscopy first and various grading systems are available depending upon the visibility from anterior to posterior grade 1 0 to 4 or 5 the speed classification is more useful compared to the other two it is based on two variables angle width site of iris insertion and the peripheral iris curvature which could be steep as shown here or the regular or the queer as you will see in the pigmentary glaucoma now the angle width is the estimated angle between the line tangential to the trabecular meshwork and a line tangential to the surface of the iris these are various pictures to show you the grading of the angle zero is where the iris is in direct contact with the cornea grade 2 where the trabecular meshwork partly is seen and grade 3 where you can see this scleral spur here and this is the ciliary body band visible so this is a wide open grade 4 angle now suppose you have a angle close angle or a zero grade angle then you can do various dynamic gonioscopy let me give you example this is the manipulative gonioscopy how you do it ask patient to look into the direction of mirror suppose mirror is superior ask patient to look up and tilt the lens towards the center so this will give you about the wheel heel appearance and you can see the opened angle there this is the example a clinical example here nothing is seen and when patient look up and you have tilted the lens you can see the opening up of the angle another technique is indentation gonioscopy should be done with the help of four mirror which has a smaller base curve and a flat base so when you indent it on the center of the cornea actually you raise the intraocular pressure in the entry chamber and subsequently opening up of the iridocorneal angle mechanically if it is only a positional closure you can open it if it is synical closure you cannot so basically it en enables the differentiation between the permanent and the uh, temporary angle closure and identify the plateau iris configuration or whether it is a phacomorphic Uh, induction of the angle closure this is a classic example of closed angle and on indentation you can see the angle has open up and these are the patchy pigments so it was a oppositional angle closure in between this is typically to show you the double hum sign of the plateau iris configuration on indentation it is nicely seen in this particular patient uh another technique in here is to identify the shawl base line sometimes it is difficult to identify the trabecular meshwork in eyes that are either non pigmented or excessively pigmented so what we do make a thin slit of light uh and heat it at the iridocorneal angle at the 10 to 15 degree angle so that this is the apex and the anterior line of the corneal surface and posterior line which meets at the shawl base line because subsequent structures are opaque structure so there is a parallelopipede made and the apex is stops at the shawl base line this is how you can identify where the shawl base line is this is a classic example of heavily pigmented meshwork and this is the apex arrow is showing you where the shawl base line is now how to do the grading and recording of this anterior uh, angle structure that you have seen make a cross this is how i am following the posteriormost part that you see here it is ciliary body so i have noted down it as a ciliary body how much is the grading of the pigment depending on the plus 1 or 2 that you have to put down if any abnormal structure seen anywhere you have to note down and what is the configuration of the peripheral iris and that is in this particular patient 
it is a flat iris configuration. So that is being noted down. Now, while doing the gonioscopy, one has to record and code the following abnormal structures that you see. Let us go through one by one. Now, different grades of the pigmentation are seen in the uh, anterior chamber angle. And this is the classic example of the a uh, very young infant whose uh, angle is not showing a pigment at all. Well, here is the angle where there is a just visible pigmentation. Inferior angle is shown here. And this particular uh, photograph is showing you a patchy pigmentation and having mild variety. If it is grade three pigmentation, then you can see the sclerospar, but not the trabecular meshwork structure. And grade four means intense, means none of the angle structures are visible. This is a classic case of pigment dispersion syndrome. You can see the Krukenbach spindle and the grade three pigmentation uh, of the trabecular meshwork. Scleral spur is still visible. This, and let me share you uh, with you one uh, example of post-operative gastric surgery case. Uh, uneventful surgery was done after fourth day. Patient develops uh, severely raised intraocular pressure pain. But what you see here is the iris surface is studded with the black pigments. And then we decided to do the gonioscopy. And what you see is a patchy jet black pigments coming up and blocking the trabecular meshwork. Though it was an open angle, but it was the trabecular meshwork was blocked with the pigmented, uh, this jet black pigment causing the rise in the intraocular pressure. Now, iris processes and the peripheral anterior sinica has to be differentiated. The iris processes are less cord. It follows the depth of the anterior chamber angle. And sometimes if they are very thick, you can see the contraction on the light stimulus. While PAS, they are broad and tent up uh, structures, very tough, and they may go up to the shawl baseline, while goniosynechia, they ends before the shawl baseline. This is a, a classic example of creeping angle structure. You can see in between angle is open, but the patchy pigments and bizarre pattern is very much uh, seen in this particular patient. The broad synechia, because of the inflammation or some other reasons other than primary angle closure glaucoma has this type of uh, pattern. This is a case where the iris is plugging the window of the trabeculectomy wound. And this is eye, eye syndrome where the iris insertion is very, very anterior and the broad peripheral anterior synechia with iris atrophy is uh, visible. Now, tropic glaucoma can have a variety of the findings and the variable degree of the cleavage between the circular and longitudinal fibers of the ciliary muscle broad uh, ciliary band is seen in this patient. And sometimes you can see the black ball sign as shown in the left hand side. And pseudo exfoliation may have a blotchy pigmentation. Pigmentation is more than normal, but you can see the PAX material in that particular area. The window can be seen blocked with the PAX material, which is a dendrophic like white fluffy mitre. And sampolysis line is very commonly seen, can be sometimes misdiagnosed as the pigmentation of the meshwork. Uh, the normal vessel is rarity, but it is unilateral and a small band, uh, band kind of U pin band and never extends beyond the shawl baseline. While the abnormal vessels are multiple arborized vessel, fine vessels seen on the uh, trabecular meshwork initially, and then the bend. So sir, patient with the unilateral glaucoma recurrent attacks were there. So patient was sent to us for the evaluation. And while doing the gonioscopy, I found the abnormal pigmentation only one part of the meshwork. So while doing the documentation, we noticed that the pink U came up and gradually the whole angle filled up with the blood. And it was a typical Ansler sign that you see with the inflammatory glaucoma. This was a case of Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis with the typical iris pattern. Any nevus or the tumor has to be recorded and to be monitored every year and documentation is essential. This is a case with the uneven peripheral anterior chamber was sent to us. And then on the gonioscopy, the bump was seen in the angle and then on UBM we could identify this as a ciliary body cyst. After full dilatation, the cyst was visible to us. The silicon oil field dye, it is very easy to diagnose, but the gonioscopy can show you the various, uh, how much is the angle closure with the silicon oil, the anterior chamber angle hot. 
uh, IOS sometimes they do cause the glaucoma and the one has to do gonioscopy where the haptic is and how much is the damage. The childhood glaucoma can have an anterior insertion of the iris and the typical mesodermal dysgenesis pattern that you see here is visible in this particular. Sometimes you can see the membrane and the meshwork is never nicely uh, described in this. Uh, prominent shawl baseline doesn't need gonioscopy, but when you do gonioscopy, additional finding that you can see whether it is the uh, I, these processes which are coming up and attached to this shawl baseline. It is the must that we learn this uh, doing gonioscopy uh, nicely, otherwise you cannot do SLT in this particular patient. The uh, gonioscopy helps in post, uh, posterior surgical assessment and post laser aridectomy, you should find out whether the angle has opened up or not. The failed filter, you have to do gonioscopy to find out whether the window is open or not. In this particular patient, you can see the blocking of the inner window. And the various procedures done, tip of the uh, MF glaucoma valve is seen here. That's why it is a functioning. Many times it is not visible to us on, simply on the slit lamp. And for prognostic purpose or for other eye who is having glaucoma or siblings having family history of glaucoma, one has to do gonioscopy and give them uh, the guidance regarding and never forget to see the disc through the central mirror. This gives you beautiful 3D. Uh, very shortly, I will finish the entry segment imaging, how it is relevant to us for the diagnosis. It allows greater sensitivity in the identifying the eyes with the appositional angle closure because it can be done with the dark environment. And the consistency of the image is always better and it is reproducible. It is a non-contact, non-skill dependent technique. Various techniques are available. I use ASOCT and UBM as and when required. And the entry segment OCT gives excellent resolution, but the penetration is uh, less. It cannot go beyond the iris surface, while the UBM has the ability to visualize structures posteriorly located. Depending upon the probe you use, you can penetrate more and more in this case. Now, first thing that you have to identify is to identify the scleral spur and then draw a line so that you know where the exactly trabecular meshwork is. So this is scleral spur, then angle recess. And with this technique, you can generate a lot of data like iris uh, angle opening distance, angle recess area or teaser. And it is also useful to know how, what is the mechanism of angle closure in this particular patient. It is more physiological assessment of the antechamber angle, whether the steep configuration of iris is causing the pupillary block or the phacomorphic element is there or the plateau iris configuration is there. The acute attack patients can be monitored because we know that the, there is a corridor effusion. It might recede or it may contribute to the anterior chamber angle acute attacks. And the posterior pugushi mechanism, for example, spherophakic eye, can be identified by using the UBM or the ASOCT. And here there is no role of an iridectomy. And one, as we have shown the previous picture, the ciliary body cyst can be nicely seen by using the UBM. And the plateau iris configuration forward rotation is also nicely visible in this particular patient. The pigmentary glaucoma may have a reverse pupillary block as shown in this slide. And these are the patients who need uh, uh, prophylactic laser iridectomy. And the post-traumatic glaucoma, gonioscopy though is a better option, but in the early phases or if there is a hyphema, the technique AASOCT can give you uh, identification of the irido uh, cyclodialysis cleft or the angle disease. And in particularly pseudophakic glaucoma, one should use this technology. It gives you exact position of the IOL where it is. Here it is shown that part of the IOL is in the sulcus and rubbing the iris and the haptic is also rubbing the ciliary body causing the pigmentary glaucoma. It is also useful for the understanding the physiological variation of the ankle. Let me show you how. This is the eye showing you the open angle here. And now this is with the light open, small normal size pupil. Now see what happens on the closer of the light, there is a dilatation of the pupil and the iris is going out and closing the trabecular meshwork. So there is an induction of the appositional angle closure and this patient needs the laser iridectomy. It also helps us in knowing the iris volume and uh, what is the lens vault. And depending upon that, 
you can decide whether the lens removal in this patient is useful or not. In opaque media, one can assess the uh, anterior chamber angle. You can identify whether the PI is patent or not. And you can evaluate the procedure that you have done. Like this is a patient just before the PI and immediately after PI, you can see the flow of the aqueous into the anterior chamber through PI and the deepening of the chamber is also seen. One can also do black functionality study in vivo by using this technique. And depending upon what is the layer or uh, multiform reflectivity of the well uh, black wall pattern, subject uh, conjectural separation, you can find out that this is going to be a successful black all throughout. And this kind of hyperdensity, uh, hyperreflective echoes is a sign of failing black. So in this patient, one has to release the releasable suture if you have or the suture releases and you can see the post release immediately there is an elevation with the aqueous inside. You can monitor various uh, options that you have used like collagen or the tube. But what is the shortcoming of the imaging? You can't see PAS, pigmentation, blood vessels, which is to be seen only by using the gonioscopy. Though it provides the structural assessment, the functional assessment is not possible. And indentation gonioscopy, which we do, is not possible by dynamic change cannot be seen by using this technology. So use entry segment imaging as a complement to the gonioscopy, not as a replacement. Thank you very much. Take care and stay safe. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mayuri, for a nice uh, overview on how gonioscopy helps in uh, diagnosis and management of glaucoma. And gonioscopy definitely is an art to learn and uh, to master. And uh, its interpretation it, in itself is not that simple. So uh, it's really nice to show everything so well so that uh, definitely it's going to benefit the uh, people attending this webinar. Thanks a lot. We can have the discussion later once we have the first four presentations as we have. So we move on and uh, uh, Professor Thapa will be sending an email to me and he will be sending his uh, PPT. So we can move on to Professor Nadeem, sir, and uh, I'll request him to uh, present on visual field interpretation. Professor Nadeem uh, Afriz Bhatt is the president of uh, Ophthalmological Society of Pakistan and is a uh, 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 renowned glaucoma surgeon. Nadeem, sir. Mm. We can see, sir. Yeah, we can see your slides. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Rajesh, and uh, the whole uh, galaxy of uh, mm. stars of Sark region present today in this webinar. And um, our uh, chief, uh, Professor Oke Malla, is very well there and uh, you know he supports all these activities and we are very happy to be participating in these events so that we can contribute academically to our uh, students and also to the ophthalmologists. My topic is real field interpretation step by step. As you're all well aware that uh, uh, this is my hospital, and uh, we are, you're all well aware that glaucoma is a group of disorders characterized by typical glaucomatous optic neuropathy, which is clinically manifested by characteristic visual field changes with normal or raised IOP. <clears throat> so um, the importance of uh, uh, visual field changes will be highlighted in my presentation. You know that for making a diagnosis of glaucoma, we need to do the anterior segment examination, which has been very well highlighted by my predecessor in the form of anterior segment examination, gonioscopy, and anterior segment imaging. And uh, that is very important for the diagnosis of not only the primary glaucomas, but also the secondary open angle and narrow angle glaucomas. Uh, the other uh, important areas that we need to do is to see the optic disc and nerve fiber layer. And then we do some tests and visual field is one of those tests in addition to OCT that we will be talking about in the uh, later talks. And visual field examination is actually the functional evaluation of glaucoma and its effects on the retinal nerve fiber layer. Uh, when we talk about psychophysical testing, um, 
in 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 the terms of vision, it's the subjective testing of vision of an eye. But in glaucoma, perimetry is done to assess the peripheral vision of an eye. And when we say that peripheral vision, which is anything beyond the central fixation, which is five to ten degrees. So five to ten degrees is the central fixation, and out of there we have a peripheral vision. Uh, when we say that we are doing perimetry, what do we actually mean by it? Perimetry is an attempt to assess visual threshold at a particular location in the visual field. And what is visual threshold? Visual threshold is the minimum level of light that can be perceived at a given location in the visual field, and this is also called as retinal sensitivity. <clears throat> the visual threshold varies uh, from area to area in the visual field. It's, high, it's highest in the fovea. It decreases towards the periphery. Uh, in the superior area, it is 60 degrees. In the nasal, <clears throat> on the nasal side, because of the nasal bridge, uh, it is 60 degrees. Inferiorly, because of the malar bone, it is 75 degrees. And temporally, since there is nothing blocking the visual field, we have 100 degrees. So superiorly, the eyebrow blocks the visual field. It is 60. Nasal, because of the nasal bridge, it's 60. Inferiorly, because of the malar bone, 75. And tempor temporally, nothing blocks it. So it is 100 degrees. And this is also called as hill of vision. And this is how it can be uh, draw, drawn on a paper or photograph in, in the sense to make, make it understandable to the students that fovea is at the peak. You can see that fovea is at the, at the peak of uh, this hill of vision. And as we move towards the periphery, gradually, the, the, there is the fall of uh, visual uh, sensitivity in the retinal areas. There are basically two types of uh, perimetries. One is the kinetic, which is uh, also called as uh, manual. And in this uh, visual stimulus of known size and intensity is brought from the periphery where it is not expected to be perceived. And at some point, it will move into an area where it will be perceived. And that point is called as visual threshold in that area. And Jerem screen, which we used to perform in our student days or in our training days, uh, and that's no more done nowadays. This is an example of kinetic perimetry. The other uh, more recent and more uh, uh, important perimetry is the static automated perimetry. Uh, in this, we present a visual stimuli of varying sizes and intensities at fixed locations, and higher intensity stimuli are presented and then gradually the intensity is lowered until the patient can no longer perceive the stimulus. And that is the visual threshold in that particular area. And Humphrey field analysis is an example of static threshold perimetry. The comparison between the kinetic and static. In kinetic perimetry, uh, you can judge the length and breadth of the visual field effect, but you cannot judge the depth of the visual field effect. And in static perimetry, you can judge three of them, the length and breadth of the um, uh, scotoma or uh, uh, the visual field loss, and also the depth of the depth. You can see the depth of uh, uh, scotoma can also be gauged with the help of uh, static perimetry. The most important point to remember in this slide is that the earliest visual field detectable by automated achromatic static visual field testing corresponds to approximately 40% ganglion cell loss. What does that mean? It means that if you do the, um, the visual field analysis of a patient of glaucoma, only after the damage has been done to 40% of the ganglion cells, the first visual field effect may be detectable. So uh, th this is the reason that we tried and the technology tried to find out a solution for this problem. And we were able to um, uh, uh, design OCTs of the new generations in which there is early detection of glaucoma much earlier than the 40% damage of the ganglion cells. So OCT has become a preferable um, uh, tool and a, a diagnostic um, uh, facility for the early diagnosis of glaucoma, or it is we can say pre-perimetric glaucoma. So whenever we want to diagnose glaucoma at the pre-perimetric time, we have to do the use the OCT because the visual field effects will come a little later. 
whenever we want to um, diagnose the visual field defects, we have to understand few things in the anatomy of the retinal ganglion cells and their axons. And uh, the, the important features are that the optic nerve and the axons of the ganglion cells, they make the retinal nerve fiber layer. There is a horizontal raphe line that intersects fovea and the optic nerve. And because of this horizontal raphe, the visual field defects respect the horizontal meridian in contrast to neurological defects, which respect the vertical meridian. Now, because we know that brain is divided into two halves and all the, uh, you know, uh, the, the fibers, they, they, they either cross or they remain to the same side. And therefore, there is a respect of the lesion uh, in the vertical midline. Whereas in the glaucoma, glaucomatous visual, visual field effects, there is a respect to the horizontal raphe and horizontal midline. The axons of the ganglion cells of nasal retina travel straight into the optic disc, whereas, and they, they make the temporal wedge defects. Whereas the axons of the ganglion cells, they are located temporally, they arc into the optic nerve, and they make the nasal step in arcuit scotoma. This is a list of the uh, visual field defects in glaucoma, which can be uh, seen uh, in, at various stages of glaucoma. There can be generalized reduction in sensitivity, temporal wedge, uh, nasal step, paracentral scotoma, arcuit scotoma, double arcuit scotoma, bearing of the blind spot, total loss of field except the central five to 10 degrees or temporal island. And finally, and ultimately, there is a total loss of field and total loss of vision. So these, these are the stepwise uh, visual field effects which can be seen in, in, um, in, these, in the patients. And it all depends at what stage of the disease the patient is going to present to us and when we do the visual field testing, we can find either one of these defects or a combination of these defects, depending on the, in the advancement of the disease. This is the horizontal raphe that I was talking about, which is present in the line of optic disc and the macula. And uh, you can see the <clears throat> nasal fibers coming directly to the optic disc, whereas the temporal fibers, they arch around. They arch around the, um, the uh, uh, macular area, they arch like that, and they reach the optic nerve head. Uh, the optic nerve head, the size of optic nerve head is 1.5 millimeters. And this is the nature's uh, you know, miracle that in this 1.5 millimeter, 1.2 million fibers are, are getting together and passing and making this bundle of the optic nerve and going out of the orbit towards the brain. So we have a very compact optic nerve, which has got 1.2 million fibers, uh, which are representing various features of vision and visual field and color vision and other aspects of vision in those fibers. Uh, these are the few pictures of uh, uh, visual field defects and also the defect shown in the, in the clinical examination. It's very important that your clinical examination and the defects that you see in the optic disc and in the retinal nerve fiber layer, they should correlate with the visual field pattern, which is visible in the Humphrey field analysis or other machine uh, or other tools used for the static threshold perimetry. So uh, these few, few slides would show you the visual uh, the different types of, uh, 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 this is the early na superior nasal step defect. And you can see that oh, the visual field also shows the same kind of uh, visual field defect so the clinical finding and of the visual field defect should correlate between each other. Similarly, advanced superior nasal step defect, and you can see uh, in the visual field, there is also advanced superior nasal step defect, and there is gradually, there is some enlargement of the blind spot also. And now here is, you can see there is a bearing of the blind spot, arcuit scotoma, and also the nasal step defect, and all these are joining together to show you, and you can see that the defect is respecting the horizontal meridian. It is not extending beyond the horizontal meridian because uh, it's a glaucomatous visual field defect. Had it been the neurological defect, it would respect only the vertical meridian and not the horizontal meridian. And you can see the superior and inferior nasal step and superior and inferior arcuit defects, and they are joining together to make uh, you know the circular type of scotoma and uh, there is a bearing of the blind spot here. And you can see both arcuates joining together at these. And these are separate bundle defects. They are not crossing over the horizontal line. 
they are just finishing at the horizontal line although they are joining uh, they are ending at the horizontal line so we can see the a circular type of defect in the vision fields and the finally the total loss of field of vision with preservation of central tunnel uh, that you can see two important thing <clears throat> in the there are clinical indications of perimetry um, it is done either for the diagnosis in cases of raised intraocular pressure suspicious optic disc changes uh, especially if the case is also has got myopia or a family history of glaucoma and for management purpose for the monitoring of glaucoma and follow up we do the octs but also the visual fields to see the structure and the function octs would give you changes in the structure and visual fields will give you the changes in the function in the of the retinal nerve fiber layer and optic disc now i'm going to highlight few of the uh, a few of the um, uh, reliability indices and then the uh, global indices the reliability indices we have uh, uh, fixation losses uh, here you can see fixation losses 2 by 19 which is uh, reasonable within the normal limits <clears throat> then we have false positive errors which are 3% in this case uh, which is also uh, in the normal limits 10% up to 10% of the total times that has been checked is taken as normal and false negative errors it's uh, more than uh, normal it's 18% the fixation losses mean that the patient is moving constantly in the eye and is not fixating to the target given false positive error means that the patient is trigger happy and is pressing the button without even looking at the target and false negative means that the patient is either fatigued or tired or they are the defects are more than the you know the expectation so these are the uh, uh, reliability indices that we have to see before making a any decision about the report the other thing is the this is the global these are the global indices <clears throat> which are the mean deviation pattern standard deviation um, and mean deviation means that the mean of uh, of deviation from the age matched normal population and pattern standard deviation is that if you remove the intra test variability factors like size of the pupil refractive error or lens changes or cortical lens changes or nuclear sclerosis um, these factors are to are to be eliminated to find out the pattern standard deviation so these are the global indices which help us in diagnosing the uh, the visual field defects more scientifically and more accurately in conclusion i would say that diagnosis of glaucoma requires high if not the, you know the if not the optimum high index of suspicion and patients of almost all levels of visual field defects and visual acuity can undergo visual field testing and careful selection of patients for perimetry should be done and monitoring of glaucoma can only be done by repeated optic disc evaluations and regular visual field examinations as i have already mentioned optic disc evaluation gives us the anatomical changes and visual field examination give us the functional changes of the retinal nerve fiber layer and with this i thank you for your presence and attention and uh, uh, as rajesh said that question and answer can be done at the end uh, i am happy to answer any question whoever asked that thank you very much thank you sir for a very nice and comprehensive uh, presentation on visual field assessment and uh, we can have question answers maybe after four talks so that uh, you know subsequent four talks can be done after that we have uh, dr lalita from uh, sri lanka she is uh, dr lalita sinarath who is consultant ophthalmologist teaching hospital kadapitiya sri lanka and she will be talking about iop assessment and its role in glaucoma so uh, uh, dr lalita can you rajesh yeah yes rajesh can yes, you sir. can you write down the, all the questions and then uh, ask the speaker you know rather than get each yes, one of us uh, speak up because that will take uh, pre pre yes, uh, preserve some time you, know? you understand that's what i have we'll doing that. in webinars they are yeah. doing it you know and you yes, are the sir. one who are going to put the question to the speaker maybe in the end of the session or like you said after four presentation you know yes, sir raj questions can be put in the chat box which rajesh can compile and ask everybody yeah that's what i mean that's what they yeah. usually do i have seen right. you know? that will uh, save time i believe okay thank yes, you rajesh yes sir yes sir people can answer in the chat also yeah dr lalita and here i think she is muted dr lalita is muted and probably she is on phone 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, we yeah. can't see your slide. Can you share your slide, please? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry yes. for the delay of connection. Yes. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much for just offering me this opportunity. Today, I am going to talk on IOP assessment and its role in Glaucoma management. Uh, can you slide. open your PowerPoint? Sorry. Slide. You slide. open your PowerPoint. You, you just open your PowerPoint and then share screen. I think, I think uh, she's connected from phone. Share. Yeah, I, ha I have opened it. Yeah, I have share. Share the screen. Yeah. No, but. I think I think uh, the connection yeah. is on phone. So. Uh, I think we'll have to get this yeah, right. Uh, share. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sharing. Or if you can, yeah, we'll have yeah. to get slides, I, I guess. We'll have to okay. get the slides on email. Yeah, yeah, can, yeah. Can, can, can Namrata help? Yes. Uh, I yeah, will can, you, can you see, see my profile? I think uh, one of the feedbacks that uh, Rajesh, we should notice that maybe for the next uh, mm. webinar, get mm. all the presentations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We started at five o'clock. We had started right. at five o'clock in their time just to yeah. have a uh, yeah. sort of a demo only, sir. But we will do it so, uh, maybe. Can, a day can you can you can you email your slides at this email which is there in the chat? Next time you get the emails and then mute yourself. That's it. Meanwhile, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Noman. Uh, maybe he can uh, start his presentation and we can uh, do the rest. Dr. Noman is a senior consultant of. Uh, can we can we go ahead, sir? Yeah. Maybe. Sam. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Noman okay, Sam. About you, optic disc you. evaluation key points. Admin, can you put your email here for ma'am to uh, email the slides to you? We'll do it, ma'am. I'm in touch with her. I'll do it. So, my slide is visible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Am I, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. So, respected panelists and uh, respected uh, speakers, uh, good evening to everybody. I'm really delighted to be here with you. And my topic is optic nerve head analysis, the points to be noted. So evaluation of the optic nerve head is the most important and key examination in the diagnosis of glaucoma. The optic nerve head is the distal portions of the optic nerve that is directly susceptible to elevated intraocular pressure. And what are the methods of evaluation uh, through the uh, through the direct visualization and through the imaging. So I am uh, talking about the direct visualization of the optic disc assessment. We can do it with the direct ophthalmoscopy, indirect ophthalmoscopy, with like slit lamp biomicroscopy with 60 diopters, 78 diopters, 90 diopter condensing lenses. And uh, my fellow colleagues will uh, talk about the imaging system of this evaluation, like stereoscopic fundus photography, red field photography, confocal laser photography, and optical coherence tomography. So what are the important features to be noted when we see a disc? Uh, one is optic disc size and shape. Second one is optic curb size and shape, of curb disc ratio, and laminar cribrosa visibility, neuroretinal ring area and configuration, Optic disc color, peripheral peripapillary region, optic disc vessels configuration, and peripapillary nerve fibril layer. And what about the optic disc size and shape? Normally, optic disc is an ellipse with a long axis vertical. Vertically, it is five to ten percent larger than the horizontal diameter. And uh, it uh, size varies with the population. Even African Asian have a larger disc than the Europeans. Men have a lar slightly larger disc than the women, and the, it is larger in myopia if it is more than five diopter myopia, and it is smaller in the hyperopia if it is less than five diopter hyperopia. 
more than five diopter hyperopia. Then what about the optic cup size and shape? The normal shape is round to horizontal oval and horizontal diameter is usually 7% larger than the vertical. So very interesting, the, uh, the disc is vertically oval and the cup is horizontally oval. And the cup disc ratio, we all know average cup disc ratio is in, on in around 0.5 and less than 10% of normal population have a ratio of more than 0.5. And it is strongly correlated with the disc size. This is very important. And a neuroretinal ring, this is the portion of the outer side of the cup uh, between the outer side of the uh, cup and uh, the outer side of the uh, disc. The average neuroretinal ring is 1.5 to 2 millimeter of uh, square millimeter. Neural rim areas varies with the disc size. Larger discs have a larger rim areas. And 83% uh, of the eyes follows the isn't rule. Inferior rim is greater than the superior. And nasal rim is greater than the temporal. Nerve fiber layer, radially oriented striations seen in the red free photography. You can see the radial oriented nerve fibers uh, that created from the optic disc. And I have already talked about the normal optic disc. What about the changes in the glaucoma? So the first change we have to notice is the vertical enlargement of the curve. The curve enlarges in glaucoma due to loss of retinal nerve fibers, since only loss trends to occur in the superior and inferior poles. This causes the vertical enlargement of the curve. So ultimately the curve is enlarged vertically. An asymmetry of the cup size is very much important. In absence of congenital anomaly or significant anisometropia, left and right optic disc of normal individual resembles each other. Hence, any detectable difference more than 0.2 is unusual, and we have to make it a suspect. Alteration of the laminar cubrosa. Normally, the round openings of the laminar cubrosa are not visible because they're obscured by the nerve fibers. In glaucoma, the openings can be seen due to bearing of the laminar cubrosa, the laminar dot sign. This is very important. And gradually, when the nerve fiber damages more, the laminar pores will be enlarged and, uh, the, and uh, the laminar dot sign is more visible. And it is a relatively non-specific sign. Oval-shaped slit light is opposite to the round. And backward boiling of the lamina is visible in the 3D pictures uh, here. The first one, you can see when it's starting of the uh, laminar dot sign uh, within the uh, cup. And uh, when the cup ratio is unless uh, there is a loss of neuroretinal rim, the laminar dot sign is visible. Neural rim loss. Uh, generalized rim loss can be occurs. Uh, difficult to distinguish from the physiological cupping. Most common type of optic disc progression pattern in early glaucoma and especially most common in the childhood glaucoma. So neural rim loss can be uh, generalized and can be focal. So uh, uh, when it is a generalized rim loss, that there is a generalized uh, enlargement of the curve disc ratio. So it is really very really challenged to identify the early glaucoma in case of generalized rim loss. But it is very easy to diagnose a focal rim loss because it is a localized fiber loss. You can see uh, uh, there is a, in this picture, there's a gradual enlargement of the uh, inferior cup and that gradually touches the uh, uh, disc margin. And this is called the localized rim loss, localized fiber loss. It, if it is a less than 60 degree, this is called notching. If it is more than the 60 degree, then it, uh, it is called the thinning. It can be unipolar, it can be bipolar. And, uh, and it is a very uh, diagnostic sign uh, to diagnose glaucoma, the thinning and notching. And neural rim configuration, what I have already uh, mentioned, isn't true. 83% cases that isn't true follows. But it, it, there is any uh, break of isn't rule, like uh, inferior is uh, greater than the superior normally. But in this case, 
the superior rim is greater than the inferior rim. It means there is some inferior rim loss. In that case, it is very much suspicious for the glaucoma, and we have to do for the further investigations like um, Humphrey visual field and optical coherence tomography. Pallor of the disc. Pallor is an important indicator of glaucomatous damage, but it especially more important in the neurological damage. But it helps to diagnose glaucomatous damage also, but and can sometimes be difficult to separate from the cupping, as more lamina white color become exposed, the area of pallor is increased. So it depends on the uh, nerve fiber loss. The more uh, laminar cabrosa is exposure, is, if there is exposure of the more laminar cabrosa, the more pallor will be visualized. Here you can see sometimes pallor will not coincide with the cupping. In the, in the first picture, we can see uh, there's a 0.5 uh, uh, coverage ratio. Here, uh, the pallor uh, uh, just uh, coincide with the cupping. But here is the uh, almost 0 0.7 cupping with inferior notching, but pallor is only almost 0.50% uh, area. So sometimes you have to think that pallor may not coincide with the cupping. Bionating of the blood vessel. This is very diagnostic feature in areas where the neural limb is absent or thin, a vessel may pass under the overhanging edge of the cup and make a sharp bend as it crosses the margin. This is called the bayonetting. And uh, in this picture, we can see the inferior temporal loss of the neural rim in the glaucomatous optic atrophy creates a sharpened rim uh, at the disc margin, a sharpened polar nasal edge along the cup margin, and the blood vessel become a bayonetting there. And this is a very important sign of the configuration of blood vessel in where the thinning or notching is occurred. So here is some of my patient picture where we can see a bayonetting sign of the blood vessel where the inferior notch is here. You can see a bayonetting here and also bayonetting here. So this is very much important. We have to follow. Uh, we uh, Sometimes uh, 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 we, uh, there is a uh, there's a mistake that sometimes we follow the pallor of the uh, cupping, pallor, but we have to uh, identify the bayonetting sign to identify the cup margin. Nasalization of vessels, it is not a very much indicative sign or non specific, it is a non specific sign. You know, the blood vessel remain nasally, but when the glaucomatous cup is progressed, the nasalization of blood vessel become more nasalized. Bearing of the blood vessel, uh, bearing of the circum circumlinear blood vessel, this is also a non specific sign. Um, vessel without supporting of the rim, when the rim loss occurs, the vessel becomes bared and uh, it becomes a supportless, it just hanging. So it is a bearing of the blood vessel, it's another sign. Bearing of the blood vessel, what I have already told, it is more uh, uh, advanced cases. And uh, we can tell it a vessel overpass because there is no rim base here. So uh, the vessel become uh, hanging in the media. Narrowing of the blood vessel, this is another new sign. The recently narrowing of the retinal blood vessel in the peripapillary region has been recognized in the chronic glaucoma. It is a non-specific for the glaucoma. This occurs in the areas of the greatest neural rim loss. Like you can see here is the um, neural rim loss and you can see the narrowing of the blood vessel. And uh, before even uh, narrowing of the blood vessel indicate that there might be a possibility of the neural rim loss in that area. So this is also a very uh, early sign, especially in the uh, normal tissue glaucoma. Splinter hemorrhage, this hemorrhage, uh, peripapillary hemorrhage, and the, this is another uh, sign and the risk factor for the glaucoma progression. Though it is a transient, but it is a pathogenesis is still undetermined, but uh, uh, repeated dilatation and uh, constriction of the blood vessel in case of uh, 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 repeated fluctuation of the intraocular pressure is one of the probable cause of this hemorrhage. This is one of my case where the, uh, you can see 0.9 capping here. And uh, in the inferior area, there is some uh, disc hemorrhage. 
and after uh, when I do the red fin photography, you can see a not familiar loss here. So this hemorrhage, especially in the normalization glaucoma, the progression, uh, the, the glaucomatous nerve layer damage progression can be uh, uh, diagnosed earlier with a disc hemorrhage. Peripapillary atrophy. Uh, this is also, a, there are a lot of causes of peripapillary atrophy, especially in the myopia and glaucoma coincides each other. But, uh, you know, in the peripapillary atrophy, in case of glaucoma, is quite uh, identical, especially we have to uh, uh, take care of the two zone of the beta zone and the alpha zone. In the beta zone, there is some RP loss and you can, uh, the sclera is exposed here, but the alpha zone, there is some RP disturbance only, irregular pigmentation. For the glaucoma, the beta zone is very much important as the if the beta zone is uh, enlarged, we have to think that the more narfebel loss and uh, exposure of the sclera is more. So um, you can see some alpha, alpha zone and beta zone and the glucomatous progression is more in the, in the bit. You can see this is the beta zone, the more sclera is exposed here. Here is large area of sclera is exposed. So beta zone is very much important for the glaucoma. Nerve fiber loss. Different nerve fiber loss can be identified uh, in the red free photography. It is a slit like or group like differs. It usually accom accompany with the uh, notching. Waist shaped defect. It usually accompany with the thinning and diffuse a generalized defect when there is any uh, generalized cardiac stresses and lust. So, in that case, a generalized defect can be identified. So, you can see this is a very small, tiny nerve fiber loss. This is called a uh, slit loss. And you can see uh, this is a waist loss. And uh, uh, it, it is usually common in the bipolar notching. So what are the points to be noted? Optic nerve head analysis is the single most important examination for the glaucoma diagnosis. Only one uh, examination technique even with a direct ophthalmoscope, we can suspect a case of glaucoma. Uh, even you can, uh, if you were in the desert, we don't have any instrument even, only one instrument is direct ophthalmoscope. You can, we can have a confidence to diagnose a, even an advanced glaucoma. So optic nerve an analysis is the single most important examination for the glaucoma diagnosis. There are other peripheral investigations available uh, to aid in consolidation of diagnosis. First, note the disc size because it influenced other variables, not various disc characteristics, what I have already included. Hope we have, everybody has a healthy and non glaucomatous disc. Thank you for your patient sharing. Thank you for the group giving me the opportunity. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Noman, for a nice overview on optic disc evaluation. We will have one more talk and then we can have a few questions and we will proceed like that. So we are ready with Dr. Suman Thapa's presentation and uh, I request uh, Professor Suman Thapa to uh, do his presentation on uh, glaucoma screening. Good evening, everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be able to be a part of this forum. So glaucoma screening has always been controversial. There are lots of views whether we should screen for glaucoma, uh, whether we shouldn't screen for glaucoma. Can we please go to the first slide again? Uh, however, uh, it is... Uh, uh, it is important, at least in my personal opinion, that uh, we should screen for glaucoma. So the two photographs that you see over here, on the left is the Kathmandu city, which is a very urban city. And uh, you can see the, the dense uh, population. And at the same time, uh, on the picture on your right is um, a picture of uh, a remote area of Nepal where there are hardly any houses 
and, uh, and still ha habited. So this is up in the mountains and that's in the valley. So uh, the screening strategies obviously have to be directed towards screening in large populations as well as trying to screen for in places which is sparsely populated. Second screen, please. So glaucoma is the third major. So I'm going to present to you most of the data from Nepal because uh, my uh, research, uh, my work is mainly uh, is also research. So I'd like to talk to you about uh, some of the evidence that I have on screening uh, through research. So the RAP survey in 2020 uh, said that, uh, estimated that glaucoma is the third major cause of blindness following cataract and retinal diseases. And this is what uh, is the uh, ophthalmic uh, infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure of eye care in, in, in Nepal. We have uh, doctors, uh, ophthalmologists who are 350. We have uh, about 22 eye hospitals, eye departments that are 20 community centers, more than 70. And, and uh, that is uh, the, the population uh, to ophthalmologist uh, ratio is about 0 0.09 per million. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the geography of our country. Our countries are very unique. We have the flat land, we have the middle hills, and then we have the mountains. And uh, as you can see, uh, in, all, in all of the areas where we have people residing, but the population is less in the mountains and more dense in the Southern Tarai. And uh, as you can also see, uh, the road maps, uh, are the, most of the roads are in the, in, in the Southern part of the country where uh, the, the, it's geographically easier to uh, build the infrastructure, uh, but however, in the mountains, it's less. And the population growth, is we have uh, the younger people and the aged people are 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 uh, less. But however, this is a uh, data from 2014. But now, as with the aging population, the graphs have changed. Next slide, please. So first of all, to understand the burden of glaucoma and to understand the screening, we have to understand what we are looking at. So there was a hospital-based study that was done in 2011, and we found that. Uh, primary open angle glauco glaucoma was more or less equal to angle closure glaucoma. However, the Bhaktapur glaucoma study that was conducted in 2011, we found that primary open angle glaucoma was three times more prevalent than angle closure glaucoma. And 80% of the angle closure patients were asymptomatic. And more than 90% had uh, very poor awareness about the disease. Next slide, please. Bhaktapur glaucoma study. So after doing this population-based study, which is about, uh, consists of, uh, which had a population study of about 4,800 patients who were enrolled in the study. So the main gist from the study, what uh, came to my mind and what I learned was that screening for vision and intraocular pressure was not a very good idea because most of the patients with POAG, 75% of the people had vision that was better than 612. And the intraocular pressure in approximately 85% of the people was within the normal range. However, when we looked at the optic disc, the vision changes, about 80% of them, of the patients had visual field changes and optic disc changes. So we were thinking that maybe if we were to screen for glaucoma, we would screen only for visual fields and optic disc changes. And 96% were diagnosed at the time of examination and 90% were unaware. And even in angle closure disease, 70% were asymptomatic. Next slide, please. So screening for, yeah, screening for glaucoma. So why should we only talk about screening for glaucoma? We are talking about opportunistic screening. So if we club screening for glaucoma as a screening for posterior segment disease, which includes optic, optic neuropathies and uh, the retinal diseases, then uh, we will be, uh, th then it would be a better reason uh, for screening for glaucoma as well. Next slide, please. So we know that uh, the early management glaucoma treatment study in the untreated arm uh, showed that, you know, for a normal field to become, to, to go into blindness, it takes 75% or more majority. Uh, so when we are looking at all these studies, they're telling us that 
really, do we really need to screen for early disease and moderate disease? Maybe not. Maybe what we have to really screen for are people with advanced disease and people who don't have disease who are suspects. Because there have been conditions, there have been times in, in, in our clinic at Tilganga where patients have walked three days and traveled in a, in a bus for two days and have arrived at us, at our clinics, uh, and they were suspected for glaucoma. And within a minute, uh, I would examine them and say that, you know, you don't have glaucoma. So they would have spent all those resources and uh, to come to, uh, come to Kathmandu and um, really they wouldn't have glaucoma. So they'd just have to go back. So that ma made me aware that it was as important uh, to screen uh, for people who are suspects but didn't have any disease. Next slide, please. So cost-effective screen. Screening is very expensive, as we know. If it's not a public health problem, then, the, then the, all the public health experts would say that, you know, it, there's no point screening for glaucoma. And also screening for glaucoma is expensive because we have, uh, we have these very expensive machines and that are not portable and that are desktop machines. And however, the way to go is by doing cost-effective screening by using portable equipment and using teleophthalmology. And in the South region, in, 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 in our countries, what we have is that our primary level care is always given by ophthalmic technicians or ophthalmic assistants. And they are the first point of contact. And if we are to screen for visual field changes and optic disc changes, then we should use equipment that are portable and that are not expensive, that are inexpensive. And if there was a way where we, where we would be able to send these photographs or send these changes to a tertiary level ophthalmologist, then we would be able to screen for glaucoma. And right there and then, we'd be able to say whether this patient would need to come seek further care. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is just a, 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 something that we did. Is there a slide before this? Did we miss a slide? Can we go to a slide before this, please? Okay, sorry. Okay, next slide, yeah. So this is what we did in 2014, where we experimented by using an iPad uh, that, that had a visual field examination. And we use the pictor camera. So we try to combine these two techniques, techniques to be able to understand how sensitive and how specific were these tools when we uh, in glaucoma screening. Next slide, please. So this is what you see over here. Uh, these are photographs that are compared between uh, a standard tabletop top corn and an undilated pictor. Uh, ca uh, camera, and uh, you, you can easily tell that the quality of photographs are good, and um, so, uh, with a trained eye, uh, one would be able to say whether the patient has glaucoma or not. And on your right-hand side, there is the printout from an iPad, uh, visual field. This is an app that we used, and then you have a Humphrey visual field for advanced glaucoma. So when we looked at all this, we, we said that, yes, we are able to... We are able to uh, 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 be able to say that we can screen for glaucoma uh, through visual fields in advanced cases. These, these were comparable. Next slide, please. And uh, these are some of the, uh, the publications that we had in 2017. And uh, we were comparing the, uh, the, the two, two tests. They were in tandem, they were published. Next slide, please. And then we went further on and we said, okay, how can it be even more portable? How can it be even more easier? Something that uh, you know, we would have uh, all the time in our, uh, with us. And so we looked at uh, the iPhone, it's, it's, it's a smartphone. Uh, it, and this is, we had a collaboration with, uh, uh, with the Stanford University and we looked into this as well. And this is what you see over here is that you can do an indirect ophthalmoscopy and uh, with, with a 20 diopter lens, it can be mounted on an iPhone and, uh, and we are able to take photographs of the anterior as well as the posterior segment uh, uh, photographs. And this apparatus, uh, it just costs about um, 
uh, uh, maybe a hundred dollars and not more than that, and not, not including the phone and the 20 adapter lens. Next slide, please. So uh, the photographs were taken. There was a cloud uh, with all the information was uh, um, uh, uploaded in the cloud. And uh, there was communication between the ophthalmic technician and uh, the ophthalmologist. It just came up like a notification on a Facebook. Uh, and uh, uh, immediately we were able to communicate with our technicians and they were able to communicate with their patients. Next slide, please. And uh, so we started uh, experimenting and see that how, you know, how can we do this in our community center? So we divided in this into phase one. Next slide, please. And these were the four community centers that were, that were connected to our center. So we had uh, ophthalmic technicians. We handed the ophthalmic technicians with, uh, with, the, with the smartphone and, um, uh, and the Paxos scope. It's, not, it's called as a Paxos scope. And uh, we did a, uh, did a study. Next slide, please. And in this study, we, we uh, compared the clinical examination of an ophthal ophthalmic technician uh, whether it was as good as uh, um, as the the photograph, for example, the ophthalmic technician had to uh, had to uh, examine the patient, write the diagnosis, and uh, uh, decide whether to refer or not to refer. And then he was handed over um, uh, the the camera, and uh, the photographs were taken and sent to the ophthalmologist. And uh, we looked at the uh, we looked at the photographs and made a diagnosis and we compared our diagnosis with uh, uh, with uh, their clinical examination. So we compared their clinical diagnosis with our diagnosis that was taken through photographs. Next slide, please. Yes, next slide again. And uh, what we did fi find was that uh, there, were, uh, there were many cases that were missed, especially posterior segment diseases uh, based only on the clinical examination of the ophthalmic technician. And um, uh, we did find that uh, uh, the camera uh, did pick up uh, uh, cases uh, that were missed by the ophthalmic technician. So we proved that it did have a role in the apparatus did have a role in the community. Next slide, please. Yeah, so it was the feasibility. Yes, it was easy to train and substantial rate of missed referrals and it did have value in posterior segment diseases altogether. Next slide, please. And phase two, we took it out outside the community eye center. So our community eye centers are at a very pivotal point in, in, the, in the district headquarters. But once you leave the district headquarters and when you go out to screen, uh, then um, uh, the, we don't have a slit lamp and uh, we don't have uh, all the uh, all the higher equipments. I mean, the most sophisticated equipments. So we took the Paxos with us. Next slide, please. And yeah, so we uh, again we took photographs and uh, and we were able to screen for vision and uh, and we did the same experiment again. Next slide, please. Where we compared uh, the role of a flashlight. Uh, in, in, in checking anterior segment diseases and a direct ophthalmoscope in making diagnosis against, next slide please. Against, uh, you know, the, the same thing that the camera taking anterior segment diseases and uh, the Paxos, uh, uh, Paxos um, uh, scope taking posterior segment diseases. Next slide please. And, we again found that the, the, uh, the findings were similar in which again, there, was, uh, there, was, um, the, there were so many cases that went, that went undiagnosed were, you know, were diagnosed using our portable equipment. All right, next slide again, please. So uh, we have uh, reported this as well in 2019 and 2020, and uh, we have been trying to say that this can be uh, done. And if uh, done correctly, uh, we will be able to screen for glaucoma in a very opportunistic way. Next slide, please. And lately what we are uh, studying now is a, a, a virtual reality 
uh, it's known as the Toronto Portable Perimeter. So we are doing a validation study for this and seeing if this can be uh, compared with a standard Humphrey, uh, um, Humphrey visual field machine. Next slide, please. Yeah, so as you can see, these are the printouts over here. It's very comparable and, um, and um, it, it, it looks not only just at a supra threshold testing, but it, it also does uh, threshold, full threshold testing. And also it has apps, it has uh, uh, programs for looking into progression. So uh, it, it is almost serving as a, as a very well equipped uh, um, visual field uh, um, perimeter, portable perimeter. Next slide, please. And in phase three, what we wish to do, what we wish to do in 2020, but unfortunately, as we all have been affected by the pandemic, our research studies have halted, is trying to combine the smartphone teleophthalmology with the portal visual field evaluation. And uh, we know that uh, uh, when we do this, we would be able to um, increase the sensitivity and the specificity of, uh, of these equipment. And along with the clinical diagnosis and all of these three you know, together, then, then we would be able to, along with the clinical examination and adding these two uh, investigations, we would definitely be able to uh, screen very well uh, for a glaucoma, no matter you know, where we are, because patients are everywhere, not only in the urban cities, but also in the rural areas. So it is a challenge, especially in our countries to be able to Address uh, address the need of those living in uh, the rural areas as well. Next slide, please. Thank you again, and uh, uh, wish you uh, uh, good health and uh, stay safe. And uh, our greetings from all of us here in Nepal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Thapa, for a wonderful uh, coverage of how glaucoma screening should be done. What are the pipeline what you have planned in future and that was wonderful uh, you know knowing all about it uh, we are in the middle of the webinar and uh, we have completed four talks so maybe we can take up a few questions there's one question for uh, professor nadim uh, but and that is what is the ideal visual acuity at which we can perform perimetry the you mean the lower and the or the upper limits because ideal is always the best visual equity best corrected visual equity which what the patient gets if the patient is uh, a 20 20 or 6 by 6 that is the best vision that he can perform the visual field testing but even the vision as low as 3 by 60 or 6 by 60 can also perform the visual field test it all depends what kind of target is being used what is the size of the target what is the intensity of the target? And uh, there are features which are available in different machines. And uh, th those features can be modified to do the visual field testing in even in very poor uh, vision patients. So you can check the gross defects. Uh, if, if, even if you don't want, don't, uh, you, you can't do the fine testing, at least you will be able to do the gross testing. And then that gross testing can be repeated for that particular patient again for comparison. For example, if you've done the gross testing today and you do it after three months or six months, you can find out what is the progression of the visual field effects. So ideal is to have the best corrected vision first and then use those spectacles for the patient, especially the near spectacles, uh, which, which are to be used. There's one more question for you, sir, that you very rightly, very, uh, you know, nicely, you pointed out how visual field correlates with the optic disc changes and all that. So there's a question, there's a query that whether it always correlates with the optic disc changes or we do get surprises or we do have some, uh, you know, uh, uh, disproportionate field loss or disproportionate uh, optic disc changes. Um if we are only dealing with a case of glaucoma and there are no other comorbidities, uh, no damage to the visual field because of presence of uh, exudates uh, of diabetic retinopathy, uh, changes in the central vision because of AMD or retinitis pigmentosa, peripheral uh, sensitivity loss, then you will have the ideal 
uh, you know the visual field changes which will correlate they should correlate with the optic disc changes but if we have some other comorbidities then there can be other defects which can mimic uh, in like in retinitis pigmentosa it can mimic the uh, peripheral field loss uh, if the, we have drusens uh, in the in the macular area they can cause some problem if we have optic disc uh, um, drusen or optic disc pit they can also mimic some of the visual field effects of the glaucoma but ideally speaking uh, if we are only dealing with a case of glaucoma these visual field effects should correlate with a clinical examination of the optic disc similarly when we see the oct reports they should also correlate with the change anatomical changes that are happening in the optic disc if they don't correlate with each other then you have to check whether the reliability of the report of oct or visual field is is okay or not okay sir there's a question for dr mayuri and uh, the, this question is that dynamic gonio evaluation in terms of distance fixation with light on and distance viewing by patient in dark versus angles in dark and light while patient looks at near fixation done with ubm well, what is your view about that kind of evaluation to know about the pathophysiology in a particular patient and adequacy of an intervention just as an evaluation of the various uh, real life conditions and the way the interventions cover real life conditions <clears throat> what i showed was the antisegment oct done in the dark as well as with the lights on the pupillary plane and if there is a oppositional closure with the dilatation of the pupil this is just like what is happening in the day to day life the patient is in the room there is a relatively dark area and the pupil size is not little dilated compared to that when you go out in the dark uh, bright light the pupil is constricted so this is an accommodation is not involved even with the ubm or the asoct patient is asked to look straight that's it without doing any there is no accommodation to that ubm can also be done without the torch light on and off but this is a way to find out instead of doing dilatation test that we used to do lot of Uh, in the past now i am not doing it anymore i take the advantage of the imaging that i have that decides whether we should do prophylactic pi in this patient or not okay uh, there's a question for dr noman and that is are visible pulsations of any significance during optic disc examination thank you uh sometimes uh, uh, almost 20% cases of in a normal disc we can see the visible pulsation but uh, but uh, very interesting in case of some uh, some uh, hemangiomatous lesions in the orbit uh, uh, or in the uh, behind the uh, in the posterior pole of the orbit and even in the stargoyevas syndrome different hemangi acute hemangiomatous lesions the pulsation will be more Uh, especially in case of uh, cavernous hemangioma carotid cavernous fistula and any other different cases where the um, uh, the 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 intra vascular pressure uh, is fluctuating in that cases the pulsation will be more there's one more question for you and that is if the optic disc is showing more pallor and less of cupping so what does it signify actually uh, uh, in case of uh, if we think of the glaucoma by seeing the disc the most important thing is the uh, the cupping not the pallor uh, and the pallor uh, pallor may not coincide with the cupping but if there is a the gradual enlargement of the pallor and uh, this goes in from, in, in favor of the uh, optic neuropathy neurological diseases so uh, pallor is one of the most important sign but not the main sign for the progression for the glaucoma but capid is the most important thank you there's a question for professor suman thapa and that is uh, what is the role of artificial intelligence in uh, doing glaucoma screening hmm. a, a, a very good question i think uh, uh, to uh, to really uh, uh, tell you honestly that uh, i wouldn't be able to answer that question uh, very well 
because uh, my knowledge is uh, limited uh, in terms of uh, how much research has been done. But um, yes, we are we have been involved in in an OCT uh, screening for glaucoma, and artificial intelligence is going to be the way because when we have a lot of data, when we have big data, and uh, and uh, we are able to uh, <coughs> conclude on data from that to be able to screen, we it will definitely have a role. But uh, exactly how much there is at the moment and how that is. How, how that is going to be projected, I will not be able to tell you exactly. Probably but definitely, uh, yet, yes. on these yeah. photographs, these are the ways to go for, uh, for screen. Uh, so for we move on to the next speaker and we will have some more questions in the end. And uh, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Lalita Sinarath. And uh, she is a consultant ophthalmologist teaching Karapitiya Sri Lanka. And she'll be talking about IOP assessment and its role in glaucoma. So can we have the slides of Dr. Lalita, please? Admin? Yes, sir. Just, uh, just, just checking. Slides. Yeah, yeah. We can't see the slides. So, we can't yeah. see the slides. Yeah. Can't see the slides here. It's here. Yes, ma'am. Just uh, connecting. Just connecting. Well, by the time by the time it is connected, there is uh, one more question that we can uh, discuss, and that is uh, uh, that is for Professor Nadim. And the question is that uh, whether okay, it's there. Or well, anyways, we can have the question whether there is any specific uh, uh, visual field defect seen in normal tension glaucoma. What is the what is the trend of visual field changes in normal tension glaucoma? The uh, visual field defects, uh, normal tension glaucoma, you know that it is one type of open angle glaucoma. It's a, it's a type of uh, a glaucoma in which the pressure gradients are not as abnormal looking. They are abnormal for that particular eye, but from a standard parameters, they appear as normal. That is the reason it is called as normal tension glaucoma. But the glaucomatous changes in the visual fields as well as in the optic nerve are there. So only one parameter is missing that the pressures appear as normal or the visual field effects and the optic changes are abnormal and they mimic or they like, they are like open angle glaucoma. So all the visual field changes that we see in open angle glaucoma, they will be there. But the other features like uh, disc hemorrhage or progression, which is faster than the normal uh, primary open angle glaucoma, that is there and it may occur in relatively younger, younger population. So uh, these are the few things which are a little different from primary open angle glaucoma, which can be seen in the normal tension glaucoma. Is that, their is progression that... is faster, but their pattern is almost the same, just like open angle. So do they, yes, do they have to be uh, followed up more frequently because their pressures are more frequently? You have to have high index of suspicion for them. You have to check their visual fields more frequently. And o OCT for progression, OCT is not that helpful. Rather, visual fields are more helpful. You also do their neuroradiological studies to find out is there a there are sometimes you see pituitary tumors, you know, the early beginning of the pituitary tumors, and they mimic some kind of visual field effects. Early, um, you know, the bitemporal hemianopia, or uh, it starts looking like a nasal field effect. And if you get the MRI done of that patient, 
we find out that there is some tumor in the brain which is causing or mimicking mimicking the visual field effects so all these patients should get the neuro radiological investigations in addition to other things thank you sir so uh, ava ma'am you wanted to say something me yeah i i thought you um, want to say something no i would like to use one question professor nadim the what will be their target pressure in this uh, normal tension glaucoma that's a very very difficult question to answer because they already have a pressure like 10 or 12 or 13 or 14 and still they are showing uh, progression in the changes and uh, changes in the visual field and you know i i i have patients whose pressure is being maintained at the level of 6 or 7 after trabecular ectomy and their pressures are maintained at that level and still they show little progression in the octs and visual field changes over the period of years so <laughs> their pressure initially was 14 and 13 and it has been brought down to 6 or 7 and only then we are able to control a little bit uh, about their progression of their disease so mm -hmm. these are the patients who show very rapid changes rapid damage to the optic nerve and they have some vascular phenomena is happening to them and because of that they are they, are, they show early changes in comparison to the primary open angle so their pressures have to be brought to less than 10 only then you will be able to maintain their uh, visual fields to some extent can i uh, add to this nadim sorry can i yes, add please. to this what you said uh, professor eva was a very nice question the uh, answer to this is there is a special clinic in moorfields eye hospital that is called a normal tension glaucoma clinic and there is a lady who heads it i happen to attend that i don't remember her name and exactly what nadeem said they maintain people's pressure below 10 mm of mercury and i was surprised and shocked to see that clinic then maintaining a pressure because the definition of hypotony is that the pressure of less than 6 is hypotony so they are maintaining patient's pressure between 6 and 10 and uh, having said that normal tension glaucoma is a medical disease is not a uh, ocular disease because you got to find a medical association like renaults phenomena or migraine or things like that uh, if you investigate the patient thank you thank you sir so can i add one line here yeah. that the yeah. Uh, there are normal tension glaucoma has the many variables one of them is only uh, intraocular pressure that is been treated by us but one has to look at the vascular phenomenon so carotid doppler study or the angiography vertebral artery angiography and all this and the apnea studies that should also be added to your uh, uh, list of the investigation before you establish this as a purely a case of ntg because sometimes the compliance is also an issue so there are so many points to be looked at uh, before we say that uh, it's only the intraocular pressure which is playing the role in this case. absolutely man i mean that's what it uh, that's what uh, so, prof mt has meant that the sort of thing has been coming out one more point i would like to say that if it is advanced case of glaucoma then uh, 10-2 program is more preferred and even the vision is uh, less than 660 up to 3 meters you can test that patient using the size 5 stimulus and the macula program so that will add to your uh, uh, investigation for the monitoring of this patient thank, thank you thank you so we move on to the next speaker and dr lalita sinarath will be talking mm -hmm. about iop assessment and its role in glaucoma Yeah, thank you very much, the organizing committee, for giving me opportunity. And sorry for my delay in connections. My apology. Uh, today I am discussing the assessment and its role in glaucoma management. I have. Can you move to the next slide? I have no financial disclosure. Next slide. Next slide, please. Why IUP is so important? Because every single millimeter counts for glaucoma progression. Next, please. IOP is the only modifiable risk factor in glaucoma, and uh, the one millimeter reduction can be reduce the progression by ten percent, and we can save sight years. Next, please. Eyes with IOP less than eighteen millimeter mercury at every clinic visit over six years had almost 
uh, nearly no progression. And while with intraocular pressure more than 18 millimeter mercury of the clinic visit shows drastically uh, significant progression. Next slide, please. What maintain intraocular pressure? The intraocular pressure is maintained by uh, the aqueous circulation in, within the eye. It is maintained by aqueous production and it's drainage via the conventional and non-conventional, the US scleral pathway, and also directly correlate with the episcleral venous pressure. Next slide, please. The, what are the factors which is affecting the intraocular pressure? Next, please. The circadian, uh, it's a circadian rhythm. Uh, there's a daily variation of the intraocular pressure. Usually the higher pressure have more vari diurnal variation. The diurnal variation is more than six millimeter counts and very significant for glaucoma progression. Next, please. The lower corneal hysteresis is also associated with greater risk of visual field progression and the glaucomatous optic neuropathy progression because uh, thinner cornea have uh, a higher reading than we can expect. Next, please. Therefore, uh, Next, again, next, please. The blood pressure. The blood pressure also have a direct effect on the intraocular pressure, but reduction of the systolic blood pressure has little impact on the intraocular pressure and also has the atherosclerosis, the vascular effect also may cause progression of the glaucoma. Next, please. The valsalva manual, the increased... Uh, Pressure within the lungs as well as in the abdomen, which cause increased epicellus venous pressure, also have a very dramatic effect on the glaucoma progression. Next, please. The lifestyle, such as excessive exercise, has drastically reduced the intraocular pressure for a short period. Therefore, uh, doing exercise also have an effect on reducing the intraocular pressure. Next, please. And also the large drinking large volume of water or fluid rapidly drinking can increase the intraocular pressure also the alcohol and the marijuana can also uh, decrease the intraocular pressure but we can't practice because it's uh, totally not ethical next slide please the intraocular pressure measurement is very important because there are several way of um, um, intraocular pressure measurements and there are indentation, aplanation, combined indentation and aplanation. There are rebound and also contour methods are there. Therefore, the, though there are several methods, the intraocular pressure measurement is a critical and has to be very accurate. Next slide, please. Based on the Imberg fix principle, the Goldman tonometry is the gold standard. Uh, it needed to flatten the area of 3.0 millimeter diameter in the cornea. But the Pascal is independent from the corneal thickness and biometrics and give a very good intraocular pressure reading. The, also, the non-contact applanation tonometer like air puff is used for mass screening and the rebound tonometer is coming up has a very good correlation with the Goldman, which is very user-friendly and it's very uh, use, very good to use for screening purposes as also, also it's very, very well very uh, user-friendly. Next slide, please. Errors in the tonometry can be due to the patient factor and observer factor and the instrumental factor. Next slide, please. The patient factor is due to low IOP reading. Artificially low IOP reading is due to the inadequate fluorescing within the eye. Therefore, it causes uh, false low reading in the eye. And also, the, when there's an epithelial corneal edema, which gives a high degree of suspicious of uh, in high intraocular pressure, but it also can cause uh, low reading falsely. And patients undergone uh, Refractive surgery has thinner cornea, also get false reading and 
the Pascal and dynamic contortonometer are best, best uh, uh, tonometry for them. Next slide, please. The reading which are, are for artificially high due to thick fluorescent wires and pressure on the globe by the examiner's fingers. And uh, if the patient is squeezing the eye and if the patient is wearing a very tight collars or very tight ties, Therefore, we have to just relax the patient while sitting on the sit lamp and ask the patient to relax and breathe very slowly. And you should not press on the globe while you are opening the eye with your fingers and uh, should uh, advise the patient to be rest on the sit lamp, chin rest. Next slide, please. If the patient have a distorted Maya in a distorted corneas, like a character corners, cornea scars, graft, then they have a distorted myas. Therefore, we have to take two readings, which with the, the red mark has to be rotated in the axis, both axes, and give the average reading for those patients. Next slide, please. With the COVID, present COVID pandemic, infection control is mandatory because it can spread through the tear film. Therefore, clean the tonometer tip with isopropyl alcohol wipes or soak in a disinfectant. I hope all the participants and uh, the panel also safe during this COVID state. Then we'll see what is the role of IOP in the management of glaucoma. Next slide, please. Next. Then, then we'll talk on the target intraocular pressure. The target intraocular pressure is the pressure range that is estimated to slow or hold the disease progression. Next, please. The target IOP range should be personalized and depend on the baseline intraocular pressure, stage of the disease, estimated progression rate, and the life expectancy. As I discussed in the earlier questions, we have to maintain the target IOP according to their baseline intraocular pressure. Next slide, please. The target IOP is a dynamic range. It has to be re-evaluated with time and varies from person to person. Next, please. The glaucoma, the patients with high-risk glaucoma, the, this actually, uh, we don't have our guidelines and our data in our country. Thus, I took this from the APO guidelines, the risk categories of glaucoma progression. The patients with high risk of glaucoma progression, such as anger, pressure glaucoma, pseudo exfoliating glaucoma, and the secondary glaucoma, and persisting high intraocular pressure, advanced and bilateral field loss, and also in young patients with advanced disease, they are the very serious patients. They need to control their intraocular pressure from their baseline about 40% reduction. Next slide, please. Therefore, it should be about two standard deviation below the population means. Next, please. <laughs> glaucoma with moderate five-year risk of visual loss or a glaucoma suspect of high risk of visual loss. Those patients are primary angle close, closure with high intraocular pressure with peripheral anterior sinicae but may not have glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And also the patients with mild glaucomatous optic neuropathy with visual field loss or mild to moderate glaucomatous optic neuropathy with normal intraocular pressure, they need 30%. Next slide, please. They need 30% of intraocular pressure reduction from the baseline. Next, please. The glaucoma suspect of moderate risk of visual loss who are having ocular hypertension with other high risk factors and patients with pseudo exfoliation in one eye with established glaucoma need about, next please, need 20% of intraocular pressure reduction from the baseline of their uh, present intraocular pressure. Next please. The glaucoma suspect with low risk of visual field progression or visual loss and have a low risk and you have to monitor them very closely, but next please. But they do not really need 
the treatment and they have to, you have to weigh the uh, treatment or whether you are following up the patient. Next, please. The glaucoma management is a risk factor reduction. Overall, you have to have a risk factor reduction by reducing the intraocular pressure, the IOP control, and you have to control the angle in angle closure glaucoma and treat the angle closure and treat the predisposing factors such as steroid use, UEITs, sleep apnea, uh, instru instrument blowers, and many other factors, maybe physiolo physiological or pathological, to minimize the raised intraocular pressure. Therefore, estimate the rate of retinal ganglion cell and the visual field progression by doing the software analysis throughout and regularly. Therefore, high rate of progression we elevate risk category and uh, target IOP, and you can have a stable disease. Next, please. As I said, we don't have our national survey. We have initiated a national survey in our country on the glaucoma prevalence by uh, conjunction with Minister of Health, uh, the glaucoma interest group of the College of Ophthalmologists of Sri Lanka, and Vision 2020 programs. The data on national glaucoma prevalence and specific risk factors are essential to formulate and establish an intervention in the glaucoma management. Therefore, we have, we have to rely on international glaucoma data and guidelines which, as we don't have this data. In Sri Lanka, we together initiated a national survey on glaucoma prevalence and the, as the principal investigator, I hope we can shed the light of risk factors and the prevalence specific to the Sri Lanka and may have a very specific management for our patients. Next, please. Yeah, thank you very much. This is my beautiful country and in my city I am working all my lighthouse on a sunset. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity for this lecture. Thank you, Dr. Lalita, for a nice uh, presentation on intraocular pressure and its role in glaucoma management. And next, we move on to our next speaker, and that is Professor P.S. Meher, who is consultant, eye surgeon practicing at Aga Khan Hospital, Karachi, Pakistan. And he'll be talking about OCT interpretation and clinical scenarios. Admin, can we have the slides of uh, Professor Meher, please? Uh, sir, good evening. Uh, Dr. Meher, you have sent a presentation where you need, you need to give us access. So we are unable to access your file. Okay. Meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, we will move on to our next speaker, and that is Professor uh, Afzal Bordla, and he'll be he is a founder Bordla Eye Care, Multan, Pakistan, and he is he'll be presenting on importance of MGCC in glaucoma diagnosis. Rajesh, can I present myself my slides? Yes, it is it is visible, sir. Yeah, we can see. We can see the presentation, sir. You can start. Go to slideshow, yeah. You have to unmute yourself, sir. Unmute yourself. Okay, I will present myself here. Admin, please unmute. Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. I've been thankful to the organizers of the SARC Academy of Thomology and letting me talk on one of the very important topics, and that is the importance of the macular ganglia cell complex in <coughs> diagnosis. Uh, this is the ongoing study at both I care under the Pakistan Glaucoma Association. And the purpose of this study is to determine the glaucoma detection ability of ganglion cell complex in open angle exposed glaucoma to compare the optic nerve head fiber layer thickness with the ganglion cell changes 
and to establish the criteria for the diagnosis of the preperimetric open angle glaucoma. For the purpose, I have used Fourier domain optical coherence tomography, uh, which is the RT view, with a software of 6.1 and phase 7. Next slide, please. The method to treat the patient's selection criteria was the patient with a positive family history of open angle, open angle glaucoma with a borderline intraocular pressure of 20 to 23 millimeter mercury, having a minimum of two to three readings with the normal central corneal thickness, and on the clinical examination, having a valuation of CD ratio of more than three and optic disc color and rim changes and gonioscopic examination showing open angle of grade three and grade four. Now, this is a picture of the ganglion cell complex in which we have the nerve fiber layer, which have the, the exons of the retinal ganglion cells. Then we have the GCL the ganglion cell layer, which has the cell bodies and the inner plexiform layer, which have the dendrite. So that collectively makes the ganglion cell complex and ganglion cell complex that the macula is a flap shaped structure without any large blood vessels at the posterior pole, and we can study the changes at the level of the macula, similarly as we can state, study the changes at the level of the optic nerve head. Although the still the studies at the level of the retinal uh, optic disc level, they are going on, and that is a good marker of the glaucomatous damage, but with the recognition at the time, the measurement of the glaucomatous macula has made it very, very important and the changes at the level of the macula, as well as the changes at the level of the optic nerve head, they are very beneficial for the diagnosis of the early cases of the glaucoma. We know that approximately 50% of the total retinal ganglion cell, they synapse in the central five millimeter of the macula. There have been done different comparative studies and they have shown that an objective structural assessment of the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness of optic nerve and macula by the imaging devices like the OCD that is very useful. The professor David Hung of the Cassie Eye Institute that he studied the different anatomical conditions and he came to the conclusion that we can conclude it better when we are studying at different level like the macula, the optic nerve head, that early versus the moderate and severe damage they can be pointed out earlier. Similarly, by monitoring the rate of the thinning of the ganglion cell complex and nerve fiber layer, the glaucoma condition can obtain objective measurement of the rate of the disease progression, and that can be used preferably in cases of preperimetric glaucoma. And similarly, when their different studies was done by Professor David, it was found that that OCT shows changes earlier as compared to the real field effects in the cases of the glaucoma suspects and cases of the preperimetric glaucoma. The progressive loss of the ganglion cell complex has been helpful in making the decisions to treat ocular hypertensive in patient with the preperimetric glaucoma. And nowadays it is a known fact and um, different studies had already proved it. If we go in detail, the average ganglion cell thickness is approximately 90 to 95 to 100 microns and change of five or more microns is considered significant. And the glaucoma structural diagnostic index now it is the criteria for the glaucoma diagnosis of the glaucoma. Now it, is a, it has been studied the structural changes, they always proceed the functional changes. By the time 20 to 30% 20 of the nerve fiber layer has been damaged, the wheel field changes, they begin. And the time difference between the nerve fiber layer damage and the wheel field changes is approximately three to five years. So this is a major point now that instead of the wheel field defects if the, on the macula, if we go on study the changes at the nerve fiber layer, they appear three to four year earlier as, and they are more apparent as compared to the real field effect. The different studies as I'm show, showing over here and the different groups, they studies the macula and the optic nerve head, they were the Wallerstein and colleagues. They studied the macular thickness and compared it hit with the optic nerve, optic nerve level. Then Ladder and colleague to perform the case control study evaluating the macular volume and its relationship with the macular volume with the optic nerve 
and Tan and colleagues had a cross sectional study establishing some diagnostic accuracy of the ganglion cell complex. To much summarize, we can say that if we are having a parallel study of the optic nerve head and the macula, the macula has its own importance and its own importance because of the reason it has a flat surface, there are no blood vessels, and we can have its picturized easily as compared to the optic nerve head. The detail of the changes at the level of the macula that is in two form, they are in the form of the macular volume, macular FLV that provides a quantitative measurement for the amount of the significant macular ganglion cell loss, while the global loss volume GLV that measures the average area of GCC loss over the entire GCC map, it indicates the diffused area. So changes they are going to be in the form of FLV and in the form of the globus loss volume. Now here are the different cases. In case one, that was a 21 year old male, the intraocular pressure was a borderline, as I said, 22 to 23. CD ratio was 0 0.4. And the macular ganglion cell study chose, shows the changes in the global loss volume. If you see the circumpapillary of the right eye, it is normal. Similarly, on the left eye, the circumpapillary natural nerve fiber layer thickness, that is normal. But if you see the macular area, there is a light global loss volume present. Similarly, on the left eye, we can see the left global loss present. So the optic nerve is normal, but the changes at the macula, they have started. In second case, again, the intraocular pressure was 20 to 23 millimeter mercury, open angle of grade four, CD ratio being 0 0.6, and the macular ganglion cell analysis shows loss of global loss volume. Again, similar optic nerve was normal on the right eye, the left optic nerve was normal, while there was a global loss volume present in the right eye, and similarly, there was a global loss present in the left eye. This is a third case, again, having intraocular pressure of 20-20 with a CD ratio of 0 0.6 and the macular ganglion less showing changes. <clears throat> Normal optic nerve head of the right and left eye, while the focal loss volume shown on the right eye and similarly the focal loss volume shown on the left eye. Again, case four, having the global loss volume with the normal optic disc changes on the right and the normal optic disc changes on the left with global loss volume present on the right eye and the global loss volume present on the left eye. And again, the case five, having the similar changes, grade four open angle, intraocular pressure of 21 to 20, 22, and focal loss of two changes, they were the borderline, normal optic disc on the right and left eye with the similar type of changes with the focal loss volume on the right eye and the focal loss volume present on the left eye. Coming to a very interesting case that represents the GCC progression analysis. Now, this was a patient which was a, labeled as a preperimetric glaucoma and was put on the prostaglandin for the control of intraocular pressure. If you see the intraocular pressure is 19 millimeter of mercury on the both eyes and grade four apparent angle, while well, the macular ganglion cell analysis, when we go onto the optic disc that is normal on the right eye, the left eye is normal. But if we see the changes on the macular ganglion cell, normal. but on the left eye, there is a superior macular thinning with focal loss volume of 2.12% and global loss volume of 8.8%. Now I continued with this patient and after four five months, Despite of the controlled intraocular pressure, it was found the right macular ganglion cell that stays the normal, while there is an increase in the focal loss volume of the left eye with 3.31% and the global loss volume of 9.4%. So that shows how the changes at the level of the macula, they progress despite of the control of intraocular pressure. And still in all these cases, there are no changes seen at the level of the optic nerve head. Now, this is the analysis of all these cases in which there is a focal loss or global loss volume, the optic nerve head is normal. Now, this is an ongoing study, and so far, I have done more than 35 cases. Now, coming to the last patient, this is a 55-year-old male with an open angle glaucoma, 
and this was again on prostaglandin intraocular pressure was reduced to 16 mm of mercury now if you see the right eye there are disc changes in the inferior segment while the left eye is normal and if you see the macular ganglion cell that shows the similar changes of the focal loss volume and the global loss volume as there were changes at the level of the optic nerve head so on the same time the similar changes they are taking place at the optic disc head as well as at the uh, macula and this is the latest, latest software in which we can have the changes at the same time we can measure the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness of the optic nerve head on the right and the left end and we can have the changes at the level of the macula in the right and the left eye further the macular ganglion cell complex analysis is divided into thickness of the superior gcc inferior gcc and average gcc this is how we can know about the changes at the levels of the macula. My take home message is the macular ganglion cell complex measurements are less variable than the circumpapillary retinal fiber layer measurement. And that's the reason the macula is a flat structure at the posterior pole and it is without the interference from the central retinal vessels and it is without the interference from the peripapillary atrophy. Macular region having the maximum concentration of the retinal ganglion cell is the primary site undergoing the ganglion cell loss in glaucoma. The macular ganglion cell analysis shows early damage in form of the focal loss volume and global loss volume as compared with the changes at the level of the optic nerve head. And despite the stable IOP progression in focal loss volume and global loss volume, that indicates progression of glaucoma. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for a very nice overview on the importance of uh, macular, macular ganglion cell layer assessment in cases of glaucoma. Thank you. Can you, can is, you uh, unshare? Yeah. We move on to the next. Sir? This is Captain Afzal Bodla talking from PK737. Yes, sir. Sir. Yes, 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 sir. We, we, we want to the next Can you move on now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah Professor P.S. Maher, he will be talking uh, on uh, OCD yeah, yeah, yeah. and clinical scenarios. Professor Maher is a consultant uh, eye surgeon practicing at Aga Khan Hospital, Karachi, Pakistan. And we have his slides. Yeah, Sir. So, can you start? Yeah, okay, just give me a second. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank uh, you much, uh, SAR Academy of Ophthalmology, for inviting me for uh, this uh, lecture. I'm going to stay on the uh, role of uh, retinal fiber layer an analysis and the uh, interpretation and diagnosis and management of glaucoma. And I'm going to show you also some clinical uh, scenarios. Uh, my friend, Professor Abdul Bodla, I already uh, looked at the uh, macular ganglion cells. Uh, next slide, please. It's not moving from here, Rajesh. Okay. No, no. It, so, uh, early man, the early manifest glaucoma trial, United uh, Kingdom, DTS, they all showed that the mean intraocular pressure in diagnosis is around 20 millimeters of mercury. And this is the reason that uh, checking the intraocular pressure is the poor screening tool in diagnosis of glaucoma. And actually, this has just been resonated by also by Professor Sumantapa. Now, hypertension uh, treatment study showed that the most patient who developed glaucoma from ocular hypertension showed the optic disc changes. So in general, the structural changes appear earlier than any change in the visual field. Now, uh, we also understand that visual field loss occurs after at least 35 to 40 percent of retinal ganglion cells are damaged. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
So if you're looking at the functional investigation in glaucoma, you have to do a visual fields. And this is a whole list of the uh, field tests. You can do the standard automated perimetry, blue one, yellow short wave length, frequency doubling technique, and then the last one, the flicker defined uh, form perimetry. Next, please. Next, please. Next slide. And for the structural or the anatomical assessment, we have got optic disc stereo photography. We have got confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy. And then there is a scanning laser polarimetry. And the latest uh, uh, technique is the optical coherence tomography, OCT, which has been fairly common over the last decade. Next slide, please. So what is OCT? OCT is the optical imaging technique with high resolution cross-sectional imaging of retina using the near infrared light. It uses the principle of low coherence inferometry using light echoes from the scanned structure to determine the thickness of the uh, tissue. Next, please. So we have moved from time domain, which were a little bit slow, only allowing 400 scans per second, to the spectral domain, taking 20,000 to 40,000 scans per second. And so now we have moved into the era of surf source, where we can have 100,000 scans per second. Next, please. Next slide. OCT detects the optical optic nerve head changes with the RNFL thinning due to the loss of ganglion cells at macula. Now it compares the thickness of RNFL between the hemisphere of same eye and between the two eyes. It measures the thickness of the rim and it also measures the inner retinal layer thickness and ganglion cell complex at the macula. Next slide, please. Thickness of various parameters is then compared to the normative database. The normative database in most scanner is based on 300 to 400 patients with average age of 15 to 78 years. The database do not have patients with extreme refractive errors, young children and people from different races. Segmentation algorithms in different scanner are mutually exclusive and they are not comparable. Therefore, long-term assessment needs to be with the same OCT scanner. Next slide, please. What is the drawback of OCT? Head tilt and micro circuits can result in the poor quality, low signal scans due to media opacity, underestimate the no fiber layer thickness, and there are artifacts due to incorrect segmentation of retina, which can occur into five to 10% cases. Next slide, please. Diseases like high myopia, AP retinal membrane, tilted disc, confuse the software, and clinical interpretation errors also include failure to recognize compressive optic neuropathies because of pituitary tumors, ischemic optic neuropathies, retinal vein obstruction, as well as toxic optic neuropathies. Next slide, please. So Sanji Asrani found that in his series of cases, there are 15.3 to almost 36% image-related artifacts in the glaucoma patients. So when you were measuring the glaucoma ganglion cells, IPL complex, this is prone to errors in eyes with macular pathology, such as age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and presence of epiretinal membrane. The other researcher has found that there are almost 40.4% patients who can have artifacts in the ganglion cell layer analysis. Next slide, please. So what is should be our systemic approach for acquisition and interpretation of the OCT? We have to reduce room light in cases of undilated pupil, but a lot of people I've seen technician, they will dilate your pupil. Ensure that the forehead of the patient is in constant touch with the headband. Remind patient to blink before the scan is taking. So because the dry eyes can be also one of the reasons that you can have errors in your scan. And confirm the name and age of the patients. Next slide, please. 
clinical signet signal strength has to be variable variable in different oc uh, scanners and is defined as average intensity value of signal pixel in the ocular image so these are the machines which are normally used in our country uh, serious scan carl zeiss you have to have scan quality between 0 to 10 the best quality has to be equal or more than 7 so if you are using the rt view the best quality has to be more than 40 and the top on machine the best quality has to be more than 40 again and then the heidelberg machine and here the quality has to be more than uh, 20 so if your machine you does not tell you exactly you can always ask the manufacturer probably the best quality to get the best scan in your OCT machine. Next uh, slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so you have to check the refractive errors and if available, exit length of the uh, patient's eyes because this is helpful in pseudophagics and also in patient who got refractive surgery done. The interpretation of the optic disc OCT, it compares the fundus image and thickness map and which identifies the disc border and cup by OCT corresponding to the clinical uh, estimation. Next slide, please. Recognize that the ocular disease can create segmentation errors. We already mentioned about the optic disc edema as well as the age-related macular degeneration. And the measurement from different brands of OCT machine uh, cannot be directly compared. Next slide, please. So this is the patient who has presence of the epidermal membrane. And when you take the OC, or these OCT has been taken with the Heidelberg, and I'll show you how this photograph looks. Next slide, please. So you can see that's the epidermal membrane in this patient. Next slide, please. This is the left eye of the patient, again, showing the uh, presence of epidermal membrane. Next slide, please. OK, so what epidermal membrane does it? That it the, uh, the software will recognize the ERM as the inner border of the retina. Therefore, it increases the thickness of the retina. That's the reason that you have got this uh, thinning in one quadrant only. But these modern machines can remove the presence of the ERM and they can give you the different picture. So look at the next scan. The next slide, please. And that's the same patient. The machine has removed the presence of epidermal membrane. Now you can see how much thinning is present in that patient's side. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, now we want to look at the effect of improper scan alignment on the RNFL thickness also, okay? So you look at the scan here, it's uh, centered all around here, you know, from the center, measure about 300 to 350 microns surrounding the optic disc. Okay, we'll show you the next scan. Next slide, please. Now you see what we have done. Now this is the normal, this is the same patient. And we have just moved this scan slightly downwards and it shows you that this patient has got a problem here. Now this is the way the improper segmentation is taking place. Next slide, please. Okay. And here, see, we have moved on this side and you see the thinning on that particular quadrant. Next slide, please. And another one. You can see, and it shows you. Uh, we are looking at the same patient with the early slide I showed you, the center with no problem and no thin thinning of the RNFL. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to show you uh, four cases in which I'm going to. Uh, 
make you to realize that the RNF analysis can be helpful, but then not all the RNF thinning is also this is the first patient. A uh, 39-year-old male, he uh, was referred to work uh, glaucoma clinic for glaucoma evaluation. He was using a tonoprost in both eyes. General health good, no core morbidities, no family glaucoma. His patient was 6'6 in both eyes. Gonio, scoby showed angle open on Schaeffer's classification, CCT. Right eye measured 537 microns, left eye 536 microns. And his intraocular pressure was 14 millimeters of mercury uh, in his both eyes. Next, please. And this is his uh, fundus photographs and the disc. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going to show you the magnified picture of the optic disc. Next slide, please. So we were pretty happy that this patient has got pretty thick uh, uh, rims, um, neuro rims, and they follow the isn't rule. So we are really not convinced that this patient, uh, these discs doesn't fit in picture of coma. Next slide, please. Next slide. This is the OCT of the right eye with the RNFL analysis. Next slide, please. And this left eye of the patient. Again, normal. With Next slide, please. This is the patient's visual field, right as well as left, all both normal. Next slide, please. So we did not see any sign of glaucoma or glaucomatous damage in this patient. We advised the patient to discontinue all his anti-glaucoma medication. We rechecked his intraocular pressure after four weeks and his IOP after one month, 13 millimeters of mercury in both eyes. This was the pain at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. And this patient has maintained normal intraocular pressure over the last few years. And we just look, look at him every six months. And so that's the way uh, the uh, OCT has helped us to show the RNFL changes. Next slide, please. This is my second patient. This is a 40 years old lady. She complained of painful degrees uh, in her uh, vision in the left eye. Her best corrected visual acuity was right eye 66 on a date, and it was 69 with some variation. Our intraocular pressure was 14 millimeters of mercury. Uh, then we checked it in the clinic. Uh, gonioscopy showed uh, open angles. Again, we looked at these corneal thickness, 486 microns in the right eye and 492 microns in the left eye. So uh, we uh, faced this lady and we looked at her pressure in the morning and showed 12 and 14 millimeters of mercury. This was at 10 a.m. And then again, at 3 p.m., we saw a change at 18 minutes of mercury. And at 5 p.m., this intraocular pressure went up to 23 millimeters of mercury. Next slide, please. This is the patient uh, patient's optic disc. Next slide, please. So you see the right disc and the left disc. And what you see in the left disc is presence of the splinter. Uh, hemorrhages. Next slide, please. This is the RNF analysis of patient's right eye. Next slide, please. And that's the left eye where you saw the splinter hemorrhage, it thinning in the superior quadrant. Next slide, please. Next slide. And that's the patient's right and left Humphreys field, which are both normal. Next slide, please. So we thought this patient was having early primary open end glaucoma. Actually, we started uh, the patient on treatment. Now, what is the significance of a splinter hemorrhage? Now, these are classically associated with presence of normal tension glaucoma, but they are also described in primary open angle as well as primary angle crochet glaucoma. And they indicate the glaucoma progression and require enhancement of glaucoma treatment. And they usually precede neuroretin, rim changes, and visual field defects. 
Next slide, please. Now, this is my third patient. This is a 43 years old lady, complained of decreased vision in her both eyes for one year. She was diagnosed as glaucoma and she was using combination of darzolamide and timolol and litanoprost and she was referred to our glaucoma clinic for further evaluation. When we looked at her, her general health was normal, no family history of glaucoma. Vision was 6-6 in both eyes with small correction. Angles were open on bronchoscopy. Her central coronal thickness was 500 microns in the right eye, 495 microns in the left eye. And the pressure was 13 millimeters of mercury in her both eyes throughout the day. Next, please. This is patient's optic disc. Now, there is a little bit different in the color. This is because of the way we expose uh, the patient uh, with the camera. Next slide, please. So if you look at it, the uh, rim thickness looked reasonably good in both of the eyes. Next slide, please. That's the uh, OCT of the right eye. Next slide, please. And that's the OCT of the left eye. Can I have the next slide, please? So that's visual fields and shows you the temporal disc on the either side. So uh, we were not happy to fit it in glaucoma. So we requested MRI of this patient. Next slide, please. And that's the MRI of the patient. And you can see uh, the patient was detected having pituitary tumor. Next, please. So the patient had pituitary macroadenoma and he was referred for further neurosurgical as well as endocrine uh, opinion. Next slide, please. Now this is a very interesting patient. This is a 27-year-old, uh, actually medical doctor who was working uh, in my university hospital. Now he complained of that he's not able to appreciate the inferior area of his visual field in the left eye for the past six years. So he went to see a neurophysician where he was doing his rotation. His MRI was done, no space occupying lesion was detected, and he had his both visual fields done. Next slide, please. So you will see the right eye looked absolutely normal, but on the left side, he has got inferior uh, arcuate escotoma. Next slide, please. This patient was referred to an ophthalmologist for his opinion. His OCTs were done. Next slide, please. This is the right eye. Did not show any changes in the RFL layer. Next slide, please. And that's the way. This is a quite extensive thinning on the left side. Next slide, please. So patient was diagnosed as glaucoma and he was started on combination of darzolamide and timolol uh, therapy. Next slide, please. Now at this stage, he was referred to us for his glaucoma evaluation. His base credit vision was 6-6 six, six, uh, with uh, minus two and in left eye the same. His intraocular pressure was 16 millimeters of mercury in both eyes, again, central corneal uh, thickness looks fine and his angles are wide open. Next slide, please. And that's the way his optic disc look. Okay. So uh, I'm not in, uh, sure what neurologist and other ophthalmologists are looking at. Next slide, please. That's the right disc normal. And I'm sure majority of you can diagnose this, that this patient has got optic disc dusen which can give you the changes in the visual field. And, uh, and this is the reason that two doctors who saw him, they misinterpreted as a, because of the RNFL thinning also on the OCT that this patient is suffering from uh, glaucoma. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the uh, autofluorescence of the left eye. You can see the calcified bodies present on the optic disc surface on the left side. Next slide, please.
and actually we got his MRI back when it it was first seen. They were looking at the space occupying lesion, and you can see that you can see the calcified uh, uh, this uh, present on the disc uh, on the MRI. This was the old MRI which was first time done by the neurologist. Next slide, please. So this is the optic drusen, the left eye, and patient's anti-glaucoma drops were discontinued. So what I'm showing, trying to tell you is that the RNFL thinning helps you when you do the OCT, but you have to also understand that this thinning is not always because of the glaucoma. Next slide, please. Detection of glaucoma and its progression remains one of the most challenging aspects in the management of the disease. Now, OCD has improved our diagnostic capabilities and allows for early detection and progression. We clinic, clinicians should able to be aware of various artifacts which can be related to acquisition of scans by our technician, disease itself, as well as also related to the scanner. Next slide, please. And I thank you for listening to me. Thank you, sir, for a very nice and extensive uh, coverage on OCT and uh, its uh, interpretation and uh, its help in diagnosing and treating glaucoma cases. We move on to the last speaker and uh, we have Professor Sayed Intiaz Ali, who is the head of the Department of Ophthalmology at Al Nafis Medical College and Hospital Pakistan. And he'll be talking about what's new in glaucoma. Admin, can we have his slides, please? Sir, can you unmute? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right, right. <clears throat> so after all the uh, yeah. basics that we have heard, now I'll take you a little into the future. That's why what's going to happen to glaucoma diagnosis and management in future. So can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Future of glaucoma therapy is focusing on increase in specificity for the individual patient, the type of glaucoma, underlying mechanisms, genetic makeups, comorbid conditions, rate of progression, and the object is maintaining functional vision and improving patient outcome remains the goal of all the glaucoma therapeutics, medical or surgical. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Now there are two kinds of advances that we can discuss. One is medical treatment and the second is the surgical treatment. Next slide please. Now in the last 10 years, there have been advances in medical treatment and the drugs which are coming onto the scene are the following. They are called the ROC and NET inhibitors. They can be classified into rho kinase or the ROC inhibitors the adenosine receptor agonist and modified prostaglandin analogs. Next, please. These rokinase uh, inhibitors are serine and threonine kinase that regulate contraction of the smooth muscle vascular endothelium and other cell types. <clears throat> and ripasudyl hydrochloride is one of them. Second is nitarsudil, uh, which is available now in the form of drops alone and with latinoprost and the combination is called the roclatan. It lowers the IOP by an average of 1.8 millimeters more than the latinoprost monotherapy and 2.7 millimeters more than ropressa, which is called the nitarsudil. And FDA has recently approved roclatan, the combination for open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension. Next slide, please. Now, how does it work? The rho kinase inhibitors lower the IUV by targeting the trabecular meshwork outflow pathway to increase aqueous humor outflow. And this includes repair sudil and nitar sudil. Next, please. There's another drug which is called Vizulta. It has been recently approved by the FDA as a glaucoma medication, and it has got a dual action. It was approved in 2017. This is called latinoprostin-bunod, 
zero to four percent, and it acts in two distinct ways. It improves the UV scleral outflow, and it also releases a molecule of nitrous oxide. On the other hand, it appears to use all outflow pathways using as a prostaglandin analog, and it is called a prostaglandin plus. Next slide, please. Now, we can give the drugs uh, as uh, drops, but now we have delivery devices uh, available very soon into the market. Next, please. They can be sustained release uh, delivery devices, and they can be external devices that deliver the glaucoma drugs. You can see in the picture that uh, uh, this plug is being in the, inserted under the eyelid and which will remain there for a few months. Next, please. Now, you, we already have uh, available drug delivery implants for glaucoma management. For patients who with poor adherence to topical drugs, delivery implants that provide sustained IUP management hold promise and are currently in development. The Biometoprost ring has been developed by Allergan, Biometoprost sustained release, biodegradable intracameral implant, and there is one eye dose is another sustained release, Trevoplast intraocular implant. The topical ophthalmic drug delivery has also been developed and it is inserted under the uh, eyelid and is concealed there. Next, please. So the new de drug delivery devices are oval or ring-shaped device by, uh, uh, by Metoprost, rod-shaped device by Trevoprost, and punctum plugs uh, by uh, the manufacturers of Letanoprost. Next slide, please. Now, this is a subconjectable Letanoprost implant shows sustained IOP reduction through three months, and it is proved, proving very successful. Next, please. You can insert it under the conjectiva. And this is the trade name of Bimetoprost implant and microgram for intracameral administration. And I'll show you a very small video. Next, please. It should start automatically. This is the device on which you load the implant and you inject it into the anterior chamber, anterior to the iris, remove this safety plug and just insert it there. You can, it can be delivered into the anterior chamber. And then when the patient is put in standing position, it goes and you can see it on gonioscopy in the angle. It can stay there for three months and deliver by Metoprost. Next, please. So a new drug delivery system utilizing nanoparticles embedded into a contact lens, which releases stimulon from the contact lens when it comes into contact with the tear film lysozyme. This is also the, uh, being developed and this will be in the nanoparticles introduced into the eye. Next, please. Now, the next landmark thing is called the MIX on the surgical side now. Minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. There are the different uh, uh, the devices that you can see can be inserted through the sclera or through a very, very small NCM. Next slide, please. Now, what is the definition of MIX? The MIX have, should have these five characteristics. High safety profile, minimal disruption of normal anatomy, have internal approach, efficacy, ease of use for patients and physician. And they level, they lower the uh, IUP by 20%, but they're not as good as the uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, surgery. Next, please. So minimally invasive surgery fills the it's a low risk treatment option with topical medication. Patients with mild or moderate disease or non-compliant and poorly controlled drops for whom the risk of more invasive surgery may outweigh the benefits uh, of the treatment. Next slide, please. 
mix is the ab internal approach for patients with mild to moderate disease and they cause minimal trauma to the eye very little or no scleral dissection minimal or no conjunctival manipulation may allow surgical inter intervention early in the course of the disease these are the advantages next please now what are the indications of mild mild to moderate primary open angle glaucoma pigmentary and phf age should be above 18 cataract with glaucoma is an indication uncontrolled with maximum medication and patients who are intolerant to medications like brimonidine next please what are the contraindications primary angle closure glaucoma secondary advanced glaucoma previous glaucoma surgery severely uncontrolled intraocular pressure monocular patients and previous refractive procedures next please so what what are the these are the different devices on the diagram they are put in different locations you can put them in shillings uh, canal the trabectome eye stent and hydrus if you want to drain them in the supracoroidal space you can use cpas eye tent supra and if you want them in subconjunctival space xgen gel and microshent can be used next please what are the contraindications for mix the patients with fragile nerves severe corneal opacity cyanikia uveitis chronic angle closure and new vascularization next please so this is can you play the video no can we play the video can we go back and and on no, no. yes no it's not playing okay oh, can we go to the next now the next uh, horizon that uh, i want to tell you is called gene therapy the goal of gene therapy is to reprogram the target the target cells to up or down regulate a biochemical physiological process by up or down regulating production of a specific substance within specific cells the gene therapy can be viral gene therapy and it can be non viral gene therapy next please a new study by university of bristol has glau glaucoma could be successfully treated with a single injection using a uh, gene therapy which would improve treatment options effectiveness and quality of life for many patients the treatment targeted the ciliary body using the latest gene editing technology called crispr a gene called ecoporin 1 in the ciliary body was inactivated leading to the uh, reduced eye pressure next please and then there are advances in protection of retinal ganglion cells by gene therapy gene delivery to the retinal ganglion cell is achieved by a single intravitreal injection through the corneal nimbus the viral vector of choice is uh, aav this small virus is non pathogenic and confers safe and long term expression of the transgene the summary is given the recent laboratory studies utilizing gene therapy techniques to lower intraocular pressure and to provide neuro protection and the continued development of tissue specific vectors it seems that we are well poised for a new generation of treatments for glaucoma next please and then we also have one thing more on the horizon stem cell treatment for glaucoma the development of cell stem cell therapies for glaucoma has been focused on the replacement of two types of cell cells for the trabecular meshwork and retinal ganglion cells a recent study in an animal model glaucoma suggests that transplantation of stem cells to the trabecular meshwork lowers iop through trabecular meshwork cell recovery and enhances the ocular outflow next please once implanted the stem cell derived our retinal ganglion cells would need to migrate to the ganglion cell layer partner with the appropriate neuroretinal cells and trabecular meshwork cells 
therapy replacement may hold more immediate promise for translation to clinical use. It is exciting to imagine that trabecular meshwork cell replacement by patients, patient-derived trabecular meshwork like cells may one day help physicians to treat patients with glaucoma. Next, please. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, showing what is there in future uh, for glaucoma management. Yes. Uh, we had a very nice attendance and uh, uh, many congratulatory messages for all of you. You have presented very well, very nice presentations throughout. And uh, I guess probably we have slightly overshot our time. So are we in a position to take questions? Sir? Malla sir, Nadeem sir, or uh, we can... Sir, a couple of questions, Radish, I think. Next in five, Sorry? Five, five, ten minutes, you can take the questions. Okay, okay, okay. And then we can conclude. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, there's one question, uh, like, uh, does the changes in ganglion cell layer in pre-perimetric glaucoma indicate that central visual field changes also occur in pre-perimetric glaucoma? And that is for uh, Professor Bodla. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So actually, what I have been studying for was that, was that uh, the different studies I have gone through that, as for the real field, uh, changes are concerned, their uh, use is limited now. With the optical coherence tomography, we can pick up the changes earlier as compared to the real field, just like I was talking about them. Uh, macroganglion cell complex. So my experience has been in that in way that if we take the macula only and if we do the real field in the case of the macular area and then we do the ganglion cell complex on the OCT, it is totally different. If we go on to the fovea, the fovea up to the macular area that is 8, minus, eight plus minus degrees, while if we do the 6 degree like 22, 20, 40, 2, 20, 40 real field defects, it cannot inter be interpreted in the real field defects. So we can pick up the return for, for neurofiber layer changes earlier as compared to the ganglion cell complex changes with the OCT. And as for, there, are, there have been a lot of studies and they clearly indicate it, there is a difference of two to three years time by the time the real field changes, they become positive, but the changes in the retinal nerve fiber, they have been always there. Sir, uh, there's a question for Dr. Lalita. And the question is that in ocular hypertension without uh, uh, significant risk factors, at what level of IOP should we consider treating? Yeah, ocular hypertension actually is the uh, intraocular pressure more than 24 millimeter mercury in repeated reading, consecutive readings, there's a persistently very high intraocular pressure, more than 24, uh, just I start treatment. Okay, uh, there's another question that uh, can prostaglandin be used safely in young age group around 14 years of, uh, 14 years for ocular hypertension? Sorry? Can prostaglandin be used safely in younger age group? That is around 14 years of age for ocular hypertension. Actually, it is not advisable because it causes a lot of pigmentation. And I just I am not practicing of the prostaglandin analogs for younger patients because it has a, um, un, un, uh, desirable side effects on the eye. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, there is uh, another question, and that is, how important is measures of ocular pulse amplitude, given fact that a low OPA in low IOP is known to worsen fields rapidly, while a high OPA with high IOP seems to protect? Sorry, I didn't get that. Uh, it's, 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 the question is that, how important is the measures of ocular pulse amplitude? So how important is the role of ocular pulse amplitude? Uh, that's actually, I have no idea about that. Ocular pulse amplitude means... Um, so, so sorry, I, I have no idea I'm about that. Okay. Can, okay. Mm. 
then there's a question for uh, nadeem sir and uh, that is that uh, in children how do you evaluate uh, effects visual field effects yes sir um, visual field effects is can only be done in the uh, you know the children children who are capable of uh, sitting on, on that machine and performing that test so can understand that and the children less than 10 years old Uh, may not be able to perform it and secondly we don't have a normative data database for children in the visual field. i mean the machine will not be able to compare with the normative database or normal population so you can do the test in younger children who are able to understand the test and play it like a game and keep on uh, doing the test and you can compare their own test uh, with their previous test like you do the test today and then you repeat the same test of the same child uh, six months later and then you can compare the two tests instead of comparing it with the age matched normal population so similarly oct also has hasn't got normative database for children but you can do their test and compare their own test with the later test so that you can see their progression in the visual field also in the oct and uh, there's one question regarding central corneal thickness in the management of normal tension glaucoma so any of you can take up this what is the role of central corneal thickness in management of normal tension central glaucoma central corneal thickness is considered as a high risk factor particularly it was established in the ocular hypertensive treatment trial and uh, for the normal tension glaucoma if the corneal thickness is Thin, then it becomes a significant. But maybe we have underestimated the intraocular pressure, and thinner corneal thickness is a risk factor for the progression of the glaucoma. And that is true also for the primary open angle glaucoma. Actually, it is really, really important in managing the normal tension glaucoma because corneal thickness has a low reading. Actually, they may have higher reading. Actual is a higher reading. Therefore, they have to be. have a very continuous a very close follow up as well as very good treatment to control the intraocular pressure according to their progression okay uh, there is one more question and that is uh, for professor meher and uh, they specifically want the emphasis of uh, uh, you know what is the importance of uh, oct in uh, management of uh, glaucoma whether uh, we can Uh, initiate a treatment based on oct findings or oct is just for uh, you know uh, checking the progression and uh, following up i didn't get your question sir the question is that whether oct can be used to initiate uh, therapy the uh, oct uh, i can i showed to you that an early changes can be detected and we also use it for the progression to start the next state what we what we call as a floor level when patient has got very advanced uh, uh, glucometer changes then uh, it has absolutely no value then we have to rely on the visual field examination uh, one... i would like to add one thing to professor mayer's answer this is the difference between the structural changes and the functional changes the structural changes they always start first and then they are proceeded by the functional changes so there is a variety of cases in the early cases you have to depend upon the oct but in the cases which are moderate advanced then you have to do the vo field parallel with the oct that's what i think uh, there is one question regarding calibration of uh, uh, tonometer how often do you have to do calibration of tonometer for measuring intraocular pressure maybe dr dalita can yeah actually in the goldman tonometer you have to calibrate the tonometer actually in every 6 months that that's actually depends on the number of patients you are seeing that also depends and uh, better to calibrate uh, the tonometer in my setup i do them in every 6 months can i hear a yes. yes yeah yeah i think the calibration should be done more frequently and you'll be surprised that once you calibrate uh, i mean every meeting that we have in pakistan every time in a glaucoma talk i ask the audience how many of you calibrate your tonometer 
because their general ophthalmology is sitting there in, from the districts. And I, I assure you, you'll be surprised that out of 60 to 100 uh, attendees, only two or three will raise their hands. And they said, we have never done that. And I calibrate because I also practice as a glaucoma specialist, but I do calibrate it every month. I make it sure, uh, a point to calibrate, but as the, uh, uh, the respected lady said that every six months is a good practice, definitely. But if you want to be more careful, uh, you should do every month if you're pr practicing glaucoma, definitely. Okay. Yeah. yeah we have a general ophthalmologist, we are seeing all the patients. And we do at six months, but I try to do more actually on advice, okay. There's another interesting question and that is how important is intracranial pressure vis-a-vis -vis IOP in glaucoma? Can I reply to that? Sir. I think the, uh, the now they are saying that glaucoma is not an ocular disease. If you see studies from Canada, they say that glaucoma is a, a, a neurological disease. It's not a and the gradient between the CSF and the intraocular pressure is becoming more and more important. As I was preparing this presentation, so there were, I saw a lot of studies uh, focusing on the CSF pressure and changes in the intraocular pressure relating to that, but there was no time to discuss that. But definitely there are a lot of studies being done on this and there is definitely a relationship between the two. We have uh, many uh, messages, uh, you know, appreciating the... Uh, Raji, Raji, how many participants we had? Sir, we had, 12, we had 1,200 plus participants so far as, uh, you know, uh, from yes. whatever information I have received. Uh, it's a good number. It's a good yeah, number. it's a very good number. It's a very good number, actually. Now I'm sure it's going to increase in the next webinar. Yeah, you, in YouTube, it will... No, no, even in YouTube, it will keep on increasing. Yes, we have uh, these many numbers in different in Facebook, YouTube, and web combined. So, but YouTube it keeps on increasing because people like to see it later. We have one participant, uh, Mr. Jogindra. Yeah. Not only that, uh, publicity is also very important as because that should be circulated to every each and every country. So that yes. uh, every uh, society member can attain. 1200 for our country is uh, limited. So yeah. there should be much more. Yeah, that's very true, ma'am, actually. But there are so many webinars going on, no? So that's why probably the <laughs> this thing is. Are we live or are we done? Yeah. Are we we are attention live. is very important. Glaucoma. So we have this Dr. is Dr. very, very important. Dr. Rajesh. Dr. Rajesh. Sir. Yes, sir. Rajesh, are we concluding then? Yes. Yeah, we'll be concluding. We'll have uh, ma'am's, Ava ma'am's comment on how she felt. I'm really amazed as because all these seven speakers, uh, starting from Professor yes. Shuman Thapa, Dr. Lalita, Dr. Moyuri, Professor Nadim Bhatt, and uh, Dr. Sam Snowman, Professor Maher, Professor Abjal Bodla, and last but not the least, Professor Soed Imtiaz Ali, with so many scientific content and so many learning teaching uh, material. I myself have learned a lot, though glaucoma is very favorite subject from my uh, very earlier life as because glaucoma, it hurt me so much that it is not a curable disease. It is a preventable disease. And when, <coughs> sorry, when I have started my journey in the year 1981, after passing my uh, fellowship part one, uh, from then onwards, I have seen a lot of different opinion about uh, cataract and uh, glaucoma. When they are uh, in the bed of a ward side by side, and both are very much anxious uh, for how will be the outcome of their surgery. Cataract surgery at that time, only intercapsular cataract extraction, but still patient can see. And about the glaucoma, uh, 
if it is an advanced case, it's not possible to give back the vision back. So they are thinking that the uh, surgery is not a successful one. And from then onwards till now, uh, it has improved so much that today, uh, so many things uh, about the uh, macular ganglion cell, about the OCT, about the future uh, newer drug. And also Dr. Moyuri, she has uh, angle uh, gonioscopy in such a way i think most of the if the resident or the young uh, ophthalmologist or the glaucoma specialist they are present in this session they will be very much benefited as because she is a very good teacher and she has uh, teach us a very nice way from the normal to all the variety of abnormal. So uh, I'm not, um, if I want to explain everything, uh, seven speaker, then it will take a lot of time. And there are other panelists also, but uh, I am not seeing Professor Shumon Thapa. Uh, his uh, screening glaucoma is an excellent one as because we know Nepal is a very uh, mountainous uh, place, hilly area. And the outreach screening is very difficult, but still from 2011 to 2020, they have uh, done so many study uh, in hospital base, also in Bhaktapur, one place there, and uh, another is the out in different phase, phase one, phase two, phase three, with the smartphone, tele, ophthalmology, everything. Uh, but I have a question to him that uh, what is the data? Did they have any data of blindness due to uh, glaucoma? But I think uh, Professor Tumoni is not here, but uh, I it? will ask here, him later on. So, he, he, oh, uh, Professor Shuman, you are here. Uh, yeah. Will you please tell me uh, what is uh, what is the data of your uh, glaucoma blindness in Nepal? So uh, we haven't been able to calculate exactly because the population-based studies that we have done is just only for glaucoma, purely for glaucoma is uh, only in one of the districts. So Nepal being a very vast uh, country with different uh, terrains and different ethnic races, we haven't been able to, and extrapolating that data is not going to be uh, accurate, but uh, through, and, and the RAP service that, that are being done, they are, we, I feel that they are still, the RAP service still underestimates um, the burden of glaucoma, because <laughs> as you know, it's just a rapid assessment of uh, blindness. And uh, really we miss out on many patients who have visual field defects, et cetera. So unfortunately, uh, we know that it, it, it is uh, the second or third cause of blindness, varying from places to places. In, in fact, in a, in a one population-based study that we have just finished up in the mountains, a study called the GDI study, we found that the blindness of cataract and glaucoma is equal in one, in, in one specific ethnic race. So, so that is that is very alarming, and we are we are reporting that uh, very soon. We have already submitted our paper to report that. So so it is a major cause of blindness. Uh, the exact burden of glaucoma blindness we do not know, but however, uh, uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to. Uh, even if we don't know the exact burden, we will be able to address it uh, to us to some extent. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Okemala, Professor Rajvardhan Ajad, Professor Nadim Bhatt, and Dr. Rajesh, the main hero of today, as because he has done a lot of things for this webinar. Professor Namrata Sharma, another very academic personality. I like her very much. Uh, Professor Imtiaz, Professor Badla, Professor uh, Maher. I can remember every one, their hospitality uh, beyond any limit. When I was in Pakistan in 
Sarkia Academy of Thermology in 2016. So uh, with all these, uh, Moyuri and uh, Dr. Mm, Dr. Dr. Uh, Sri Lanka, another... Lalita. Dr. Lalita. Lalita, right, yeah. right. Uh, so thank you so very much. Uh, I'm really, uh, if it continues uh, uh, another hour together, I will sit and hear, <laughs> as because it is very, very interesting and very, everybody, uh, I think, like, and they will talk. Professor Namrata will say, yeah. of course. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. So I really appreciate, so ma'am. Thank you. I Thank really you. appreciate your energy level, ma'am, and uh, I'm really thankful for your words of encouragement. And uh, Dr. Namrata, as you said, that she is really academic, and you know, both of us are cornea and refractive people. Dr. Namrata is, you know, sitting and uh, you know, Hello. listening to all the talks very, you know, mm. nicely. I mean, that shows how much academic she is. How did you feel, uh, Dr. Namrata, about it? I think it was a wonderful uh, webinar, and I have. We've had some webinars in the past also in glaucoma, but this was absolutely complete. And the best part was that there was perspective from all the uh, all the SARC countries and all the uh, from the entire region in the SARC. So uh, it, things were a little different, but then I think uh, all of them just converged into uh, one thing. And uh, I think it was it was uh, the, the scientific content was great. Uh, for that, uh, Nadeem sir has to be given the credit because yeah. he only designed the scientific content. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadeem Bhatt, for doing Rajesh. it. Rajesh, 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 yeah. yeah. would, would you like to give some time to Nadeem, you know, you, he organizes this session. Yes, sir, and, that's what I wanted and, to say. And to, and to Raj before I finally think, uh, close sir, the session. He had, right. to, he had to go somewhere. I, I messaged him, uh, Professor. Ajar, uh, Ajay. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Nadim, I have something to say. Yeah. You know, he yes. is the one who organizes sessions. Absolutely. So beautiful. So scientific, so beautiful. Yeah, scientific content has been the, his own. Then I can, then I can conclude and uh, close the session, uh, isn't it? Sir, uh, sir. Rajesh, I yes, better sir. take your permission also. You are the one who did no, everything, sir, no, you know. Sir. No, sir. <laughs> Please, uh, Nad Nadim, would you, would you like to say something, Nadim? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, Please. First of all, uh, I would like to say thanks to the... Uh, all the leading lights of SARC region. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the, the all the people which I can see on the screen, they mm -hmm. are the leaders in their own regions, you know, and they 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 lead the uh, spread of light in their in their countries, in their cities, in their hospitals, you know. They are the ones, mm -hmm. by the grace of Almighty Allah, uh, bring light to the people who are blind or who are getting blindness or going towards blindness, you know, especially glaucoma and cataract. So thanks and hats off all to, to all to you uh, for being um, uh, present here, sparing so much of your valuable time. We started at 5.30 and it's mm -hmm. getting o'clock in Pakistan. We planned for two hours and it has gone beyond three hours. So mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is the beauty of this academic activity that all of us are sitting here and our participants are also sticking to their screens and they are attending the whole webinar. And glaucoma is such a topic that you can continue for hours and hours and right. people will learn more. It's such an interesting, and it's, you know, all the, all the time there is new thing coming up, new definitions are coming up, new inventions are coming up that people are always interested to learn. So my sincerest and heartfelt gratitude to all the leaders of the SARC region and all the participants and all the uh, speakers and panelists, especially Professor Azad, Madam Awa, um, uh, Sherfuddin Saab from Bangladesh and all my friends from Pakistan. Uh, okay, Malla sir, our, uh, our chief, our boss in uh, SARC region. He's the, <laughs> he's the boss now, he's, he's our president. And we love him so much, we respect him so much. And this is the beauty of SARC region that we are so closely knit that, you know, I personally, I never felt like going to American Academy, but I will always attend APAO and SARC conferences because yeah. I feel that there is some connection with each other and whosoever is there as participants or as organizers, they belong to the same area. They, they talk the same, same things, same, same subjects, same topics. 
whenever you go to the, to the west you never find anybody of acquaintance or anybody who is of the having the same kind of thinking so i never miss miss the sar conference and the asia pacific because there we get the energy and we meet each other and we like each other and we solve each other's problem so with this i would like to thank once again all of you uh, for being with us today thank you rajesh rajesh do you have anything sir. to say now rajesh sir uh, i i would just like to thank you all for making this webinar memorable and uh, definitely would like to uh, thank our uh, support staffs like uh, bageshwar and sajid and uh, very important are uh, the, the uh, company ipka which has supported us for this webinar and special thanks to mr iftiar who is very much there and he managed whenever you know there was some uh, technical issue he managed to get the ppts and shared the slides so these things uh, you know uh, for this he is actively there so i would like to thank them uh, for thank you sir thank you successful and uh, of course i would like to thank our seniors like you sir malla sir nadeem sir <laughs> ava ma'am and all of you for uh, making this webinar successful all of us are your seniors so you will yes, have a time for us <laughs> i would like to thank you also because i get a lot of encouragement from uh, dr namrata uh, oh, yeah. for doing hard work so thank you thank you all namrata no, no, great leader rajesh Rajesh, you want sir. to close it or can I say sir, a few final, words? Final, final words, final words of wisdom from your side, sir. No, no, not wisdom. Anyway, um, um, let me have some few minutes, you know, to say how I felt about this webinar. You know, Rajesh, you are the man of the this, uh, webinar or day, but I must say, I must say the 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 presentations uh, by. every each one of them has been of high standard though i am a retina man but i learned enough glaucoma this evening you know and special thank to nadeem you know who organized this glaucoma session you know at one time we retinal surgeon must know about glaucoma also at one time i remember the other day somebody was saying the, the glaucoma is the disease of the optic nerve and i thought optic nerve is the ganglion cells and we talked about ganglion cells and the retinal surgeon should be equally involved in gla glaucoma session also you know and some of the observation you know comment i would like to make you know the other day i was attending this and the presentation was the normal intraocular pressure in this part of the world at least in india upper level is not 21 it is 18 and i want to hear from our colleagues of the region you know do they agree to this kind of intraocular pressure the intraocular pressure they are talking in the west is different from the intraocular pressure in this part of the world i think this was a study done in rp center you know found that the normal intraocular pressure of the indian population maximum normal we can say is 18 2021 would be more than normal anyway that's the observation you know i wanted to share and number two you know in the anterior segment examination it is imperative to not only examine the cornea the angle the ac depth all that the pupil is equally important you know if you have substantial damage to the optic nerve you know the rapd you know doing a good pupil examination does give you help one of the cases i was presented was a case of pituitary tumor by temporal hemianopia where the optic nerve probably if you only you had done pupil examination you can get a lot of information about the status of the optic nerve after all it is the optic nerve you know with just damage and you can do by just examining the pupillary reaction is what uh, i was uh, i was told that day you know and number 3 is uh, the three pressure you know we talk about intraocular pressure only but in glaucoma it is intraocular pressure it is the pulse pressure which is dependent on the systemic blood pressure and lastly the intracranial pressure which was discussed in the end you know all three pressures are equally important when you are talking about glaucoma and another thing i couldn't understand is it is macular ganglion cell complex you know i always thought you know the part of the optic nerve which get preserved till the end that was what we were taught long time back that's why we one of the causes of tubular region we used to say advanced glaucoma where the 
macular fibers get preserved. You know, they do not give way to raise intraocular so easily as uh, other parts of the optic nerve. I think this is something new to me. Uh, interesting though, and. Uh, and uh, what, uh, yeah, about the artificial intelligence I was talking about, you know, last time in the in the Asia Pacific, there was a session on artificial intelligence, you know, I attended it because I thought it would be interesting. They are doing artificial interest in diabetic retinopathy. And I was told that, you know, this is deep learning. Yeah, I was told that in artificial lensing, if there is a somewhere, uh, Corridor melanoma up there, you know, and if you let the artificial engineer do it, you know, the artificial engineer will just detect the diabetic retinopathy will say if there is no diabetes retinopathy, it's normal fundus, you know, whereas this patient has a little melanoma up there, you know. So what you have taught to the artificial intelligence is what you will be uh, delivered, the message, you know. And I think it's not going to be easy for glaucoma to do, to, 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 until now, I think they have done in diabetic retinopathy down there in the south, I believe. Anyway, I don't want to add uh, more, you know, I must uh, thank all, each and one, every speaker, you know, hats off to them. You know, I don't want to name them. They all are, did a wonderful job. You know, I want to thank w one and all for a wonderful webinar, the first one, and especially to Raj and uh, Rajesh and Namrata, you know, what a team, you know, and Lalit, of course, you know, I couldn't see Lalit uh, participating much. I did see him, you know, what a team from India, you know. I was amazed in you know, how popular these people are in India, you know, when I attended one of those AIOS team, you know, they all seem to the whole world of ophthalmologists in India seem to know all of them, you know, and it's nice to have them in SAO, South Academy of Ophthalmology. Thank you very much. Once again, you know, I would like to say good night here. And unless Rajesh has something to add in the end, you know, that's what I want to say. And that's all for me. Rajesh, over to you. Just one thing I would like to add, sir. Uh, special thanks to Professor Azad, who oh. initiated this idea of having yeah. SAO webinar. And he deserves a special thanks for it. Right. Okay, fine. On behalf yeah, of, uh, of us, give him yes. the thanks, official yeah. thanks. Yes. I, 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 I forgot that Ava, Professor Ava, Dr. Ava, you know, she is an inspiration too. Very academic. Oh, quite thank a, you. She's thank so you, popular sir. in Nepal, you know. And we got a women in ophthalmology session. I did at an Ava when yes. she was there, you know, one of your. I remember. Uh, where your webinar session, you know, I did attend, you know, I'm glad that to tell you, we have got 375 ophthalmologists, you know, it's a newest figure. Out of that, about more than 50, 60, 70 percent are ladies. Thank you very much, you know. Uh, I think uh, credit goes to you also, you know. Most of the doctors you, graduated from Bangladesh are ladies, you know, and they are doing, each one of them are doing a wonderful job again. You will be glad to know. You know thank most you of them, so I believe. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. No, Rajas, can you close this session now, sir. Lee? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Uh, we, today's we youngest. To see, one thing. Hard to see all of you. One Again, thing. Today's youngest Please. speaker is Dr. Noman from Bangladesh. Yes. yes. Oh yes. yes. Yeah. Excellent presentation, I, Dr. Noman. Thank yes. you. Yeah. No, I already you, spoke to him in the beginning. You know, he's he has been very <laughs> academic, and I, he's there everywhere. You know, uh, <laughs> thank you, in, thank in you. The WhatsApp, you know, I hear I the WhatsApp. The now? So many, right. so many comments from uh, uh, Sam's. Yes, right. uh, thank you. What's up? Thank you, madam. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, okay thank, thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.